Hey, Chris, slow this down. The uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. Purpose of this hearing is to assess the accountability mechanisms that ensure American taxpayer money is being spent as intended in Ukraine. I now uh, recognize myself for an opening statement. It's been a year since uh, Vladimir Putin launched his unprovoked war of aggression in Ukraine. And in response, Europe has provided continued to do uh, more to keep the government of Ukraine from defaulting and ensure it's able to prosecute the war. Additionally, Congress has also provided a significant amount of assistance to Ukraine to ensure Putin's aggression is stopped at Ukraine's border and that a NATO ally is not next. I've supported U.S. assistance because a victory by Putin in Ukraine would further embolden Americans' adversaries, from Chairman Xi in Beijing to the Ayatollah in Tehran to Kim Jong-un in North Korea. However, it's, it's imperative that the American people know about the existing accountability mechanisms, including third-party monitors such as Deloitte and the robust oversight being conducted by Congress, and in particular, this committee. When Republicans took the majority, we made it very clear that accountability will be paramount to continued assistance in Ukraine. This is just the first of many hearings and briefings I will hold to ensure the assistance we are providing is being used as intended. Of the $113 billion appropriated across four supplementals, approximately 60% is going to American troops, American workers, and to modernizing American stockpiles. In fact, only 20% of the funding is going directly to the Ukrainian government in the form of direct budgetary assistance. As required by law, these funds are only dispersed to, to Ukraine following verification that the money is spent on approved items and activities. All funds are also subjected to external third-party monitoring by Deloitte. They are conduct conducting randomized spot checks to verify the use of this assistance. Additionally, they are working with Ukraine's Ministry of Finance to review its monitoring, transparency, verification, and reporting systems and procedures. Today, we have the opportunity to question the independent inspectors, generals from the Department of State, USAID, and the Department of Defense. This is the first time all three of you have appeared together before any committee to discuss your oversight role in the 64 planned and ongoing audits and reviews of U.S. assistance to Ukraine. Your work is a critical component to ensure that Congress is being good stewards of the taxpayers' money. And it's necessary to prevent waste, fraud, or abuse, and if need be, investigate and resolve any incidents. Congress has also been exercising oversight. Through the passage of several bills, we have ensured that there have been 39 accountability provisions passed in the law. And since day one as chairman of this committee, I've been actively exercising my constitutionally guaranteed responsibility to pursue stringent oversight uh, as well. My first committee meeting was a classified briefing on the U.S. response to Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And last month, I led a congressional delegation to Ukraine and Poland to conduct in-person oversight of U.S. aid to Ukraine. I saw firsthand the process is working and delivered a clear message not only to our embassy team, but also to President Zelensky about the importance of U.S. aid to be spent appropriately to guarantee continued support. In short, every dollar counts. The Biden administration should expect this committee to continue to be vigilant in demanding transparency and accountability for U.S. assistance to Ukraine. To be clear, I do not conduct this oversight to undermine or question the importance of support for Ukraine, but rather, to the contrary, oversight should incentivize the administration in Ukraine to use funds from Congress with the highest degree of efficiency and effectiveness. And while there is strong bipartisan support on this committee and in Congress for the continued uh, support of Ukraine, transparency and accountability are critical to ensure the aid we are providing is being used as intended, and it advances U.S. national security interest. The American taxpayer wants and deserves accountability. They want to and deserve to know where their money 
is going. And in closing, I just want to say, as I met with the, all three of you, uh, as the first supplemental was passed, I know uh, speaking with um, the State Department, with Samantha Powers at USAID, uh, with the Department of Defense, uh, with our ambassador to Ukraine, I stressed to them the importance of putting mechanisms early in place from day one to ensure we had accountability in place. And I think we're going to hear from you that how uh, that has actually has been working. Uh, it's always better to be in right at the beginning rather than later on when something uh, wrong ha has happened. So I really, really appreciate you being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. And with that, I recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, as we all know, Russia's brutal war against Ukraine grinds into its second year, and Congress and the American people will continue to stand with the brave Ukrainians who are defending their rights and freedom. Ukrainians did not ask for this unjust war of aggression. They are only asking for our support as they defend their home and their sovereignty. And it is in our national interest to provide that support to Ukraine so it may win this war, which it will. Our effort isn't just about Ukraine and its citizens. This struggle is for democracies around the world and free people standing up to brutal autocrats like Putin to reinforce the notion that might does not make right. You know, when I was chairman and served as chair, I was proud to lead congressional delegations to Ukraine, Poland, Moldova, NATO headquarters, and other critical neighboring countries in a bipartisan fashion before and after the February 24th full-scale invasion. And we were together on many of those trips. And I believe bipartisan unity strength and unity strengthens our coalition of allies and partners. And I want to thank the chairman who traveled with me to many of those places, and we worked very collectively uh, in that regard as we continue to do here. So on, and on those visits and in the hearings and briefings that we've held over the years, we've had the opportunity to see firsthand the impact that American assistance to Ukraine has had on the trajectory of this war. And we've also had the opportunity to regularly engage with the administration on its diplomatic and military strategy as well as the unprecedented oversight the administration and the offices of our witnesses here today are undertaking. Which is why, uh, to be frank, you know, the, and it's not the chairman, and I disagree with the premise cited by some others on the other side of the aisle who are falsely claiming that support for Ukraine is, and I quote, a blank check. This is simply not based in fact and either reveals a lack of understanding of the safeguards that are already in place on our assistance to Ukraine, or worse, an effort to mislead the public to undermine the assistance and Ukraine's defense uh, against Russia's invasion. Embedded in our country's support for Ukraine are strict oversight mechanisms. Every dollar and shipment of U.S. security assistance provided is auditiously tracked by an integrated, whole of government effort led by the departments of state and defense. These mechanisms aren't new. They span across agencies and coalesced in an interagency effort that has regularly briefed, been briefed to Congress, including the administration's interagency effort entitled the U.S. Plan to Counter Illicit Diversion of Certain Advanced Conventional we Weapons in Eastern Europe. Members on this committee have received multiple briefings on this very effort and have available to them scores of documents detailing the exact types of assistance provided to Ukraine and the timing of that assistance. In addition to the administration's own efforts to ensure utmost monitoring and accountability of our assistance to Ukraine, three inspectors generals overseeing the State Department, Defense Department, and USAID developed an integrated response and accountability investigatory approach called the Joint Strategic Oversight Plan for Ukraine. In January of this year, our witnesses traveled together, and we thank you for that, to Ukraine, underscoring the seriousness with which the administration is taking your work as inspectors generals. Your trip is just one facet of a sustained oversight over the humanitarian, economic, and military aid to Ukraine and to neighboring countries affected by the war. But the U.S. does more than provide defense and humanitarian assistance. 
We are providing global leadership. When Putin gave the order to invade Ukraine, he did so under the false assumption that the West would be divided and that the United States and our partners and allies would not meet this historic moment. And I want to commend the Biden administration for leading global efforts to push back against Russian aggression and for cultivating unity against Russia's actions in Ukraine. Now the world is watching us. And unfortunately, some of my friends on the other side of the aisle who happen to be uh, MAGA Republicans are putting Putin exactly what he wants and giving him exactly what he wants, even at times repeating Kremlin talking points. We cannot allow those efforts to compromise uh, the U.S. leadership in places like the U.N., where our diplomats sit across from their Russian counterparts on a regular basis to dispel Russian propaganda uh, and, and we need to and work with our global allies and continue the isolation of the war uh, and criminal uh, of the of the criminal war criminal, Mr. Putin. And so I want to thank our witnesses uh, and I want to thank our chairman uh, for his stand up and fighting uh, to make sure that we continue to give the Ukrainian people what they need uh, to make sure that they are able to win this war. He's been stand up. Uh, we've been walking side by side in that, and I want to make sure that that's clear that I appreciate the actions and the movement of the chairman uh, and I, and we will continue to work together and thank you for the work that you do to assure the American people that we, are, we know ev where every dime is. And I, with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I, I, I really uh, appreciate your comments, uh, sir. And um, I think this is a necessary step to build confidence uh, with the Congress that the money is being accounted for. And so um, other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We're pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today. Ms. Uh, Diane Shaw is Deputy in Inspector General, who is currently performing duties of the Inspector General of the Department of State. Ms. Nicole Angiarella is the Acting Deputy Inspector General, who is currently performing the duties of Inspector General at the U.S. Agency for International Development. And Mr. Rob Robert Storch is the Inspector General at the Department of Defense. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Your full statements will be part of the record. And I ask that you keep, um, each keep your uh, spoken remarks to five minutes. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Shaw for her opening statement. Good morning, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you so much for inviting me to discuss the Department of State Office of Inspector General's oversight of the U.S. government response to the war in Ukraine. I'm very pleased today to be joined by my counterparts from our primary oversight partners in this space, the U.S. Agency for International Development and Department of Defense OIGs. To date, Congress has appropriated more than $100 billion to fund a vast array of activities in support of the U.S. response to the war in Ukraine. And we in the oversight community recognize that it is vitally important to our stakeholders, including all of you and the American people, that those precious resources reach their intended beneficiaries and accomplish intended goals. Fraud, waste, and inefficiency cannot be allowed to taint that effort, which is why we take our oversight role incredibly seriously and have each made oversight of the U.S. response to the war in Ukraine our number one priority. The state USAID and DOD OIGs are particularly well positioned to take on this critical interagency overwork, given our uh, oversight work, given our long history of collaborating on overseas contingency operations. Leveraging that history and the deep relationships that we've forged with each other and others in the oversight community over many years, we established the Ukraine Oversight Interagency Working Group nearly a year ago, consisting of professionals from 20 U.S. government accountability organizations. The closely coordinated work of that group is resulting in agile, integrated, and comprehensive oversight of this sizable U.S. enterprise as reflected in the Joint Strategic Oversight Plan for Ukraine that we published earlier this year. This plan, and a report issued this week expanding on the plan, present the full range of the working group's Ukraine-related work, amounting to nearly 90 completed, ongoing, and planned projects. The plan and recent report detail three strategic areas of oversight that cover the waterfront of the U.S.-Ukraine response effort. 
These are security assistance and coordination, non-security assistance and coordination, and management and operations. State OIG has carefully designed its work to contribute in important ways in each of these three areas. Our work, which is described in more detail in my written testimony and on the State OIG website, is expected to culminate in more than two dozen products that explore a range of topics within each of these strategic areas, including end-use monitoring of U.S. origin defense monitoring of U.S. origin defense articles and other equipment, how the department is deploying aid to address humanitarian needs, whether the department has developed a strategy for the billions of dollars of foreign assistance flowing to Ukraine, and Embassy Kyiv operations from its shuttering in February of 2022 to its reopening in May to its current operating status. In addition to this important work, we also recognize the need to be proactive, especially as it relates to our anti-fraud and corruption efforts. On that front, we're working with our OIG counterparts to disseminate products that will increase fraud awareness and reporting. And we're also expanding our investigative data analytics capacity to help identify trends in the Ukraine-related fraud reporting, as well as common criminal schemes. I am confident that our completed, ongoing, and planned work, when taken together with that of our partners on the working group, will provide an end-to-end -end account of how the vast resources appropriated in this context are being utilized. We've made an excellent start, but I recognize that there's a potentially long road ahead. And to that end, we've been thinking strategically about how best to further this important work. This was at the forefront of our minds when we traveled together to Ukraine and the surrounding region earlier this year. There, my counterparts and I directly communicated to U.S. and Ukrainian officials the message that U.S. assistance must be transparently accounted for and that corruption affecting U.S. assistance will not be tolerated. That message was well received at the time, but we recognize that continuous in-person engagement and direct observation will be needed to ensure that the necessary controls are in place. Accordingly, we're working closely with the department to secure permanent positions at Embassy Kyiv, which we believe will help us better deliver the independent oversight on which our stakeholders rely. Thank you for your interest in our work and the opportunity to discuss our commitment to timely, objective, comprehensive U.S.-Ukraine response oversight. And I look forward to addressing the committee's questions. Thank you, Anjarella, for her opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Meeks, and distinguished members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the U.S. Agency for International Development Office of Inspector General's oversight of assistance to the government and people of Ukraine. I'm honored to be sitting here today with my close partners, IG Storch and Deputy IG Shaw. My testimony will describe USAID OIG's oversight response efforts, including a summary of our recent, planned, and ongoing work overseeing USAID's economic and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. I want to clearly state that providing timely, independent, and objective oversight of USAID's Ukraine response is my office's top priority. I appreciate the support from members of this committee providing $13 million in supplemental funding to our office to conduct this important work. Since the start of Russia's invasion, USAID has been the primary agency providing non-security assistance to Ukraine. This includes $22.9 billion appropriated in direct budget support, more than $1.4 billion in humanitarian assistance, and more than $800 million in development assistance. This support requires proportionate levels of independent oversight. To provide this oversight, USAID OIG has more than 60 staff supporting its Ukraine portfolio. Over the last nine months, we issued eight products, including a joint strategic oversight plan with our IG partners. Our first advisory report drew from our previous work and experience providing oversight of USAID's programming in other complex environments. Each of these responses presented unique challenges for USAID but they shared common risks that we highlighted for the agency as it initiated programming in Ukraine. 
Next, we issued a fraud alert, identifying common schemes likely to affect USAID programming. Following its issuance, a major USAID contractor in Ukraine reported to us an allegation of collusive bidding, which they identified prior to making a subaward. We immediately issued a second fraud alert warning the aid sector working in Ukraine to look for and report similar schemes. In addition, our investigators have provided more than 20 fraud awareness briefings to nearly 1,000 individuals supporting USAID programs in Ukraine. We worked closely with our colleagues at state and DOD to issue joint hotline materials in both Ukrainian and English. Since broadcasting our joint message to report fraud to the IGs, my office has received 178 reports related to Ukraine. This is a 556% increase in reports from the previous 11-month period. To date, we have no serious criminal findings associated with USAID assistance to Ukraine. This increase in reporting, however, shows that our outreach is working and that individuals know how and who to report potential misuse of USAID funds to. We also issued three products related to USAID's direct budget support, an information brief that described the three different World Bank trust funds and their oversight mechanisms. We found the oversight mechanisms align with GAO's federal standards for internal controls. In a future report, we will assess the effectiveness of those established mechanisms. Our work is also enhanced by longstanding partnerships and MOUs with our oversight counterparts at UN agencies, the World Bank, and bilateral donor countries. With the current limitations on US government personnel in Ukraine, these relationships offer a front row seat to what is happening on the ground. This collaboration also sends a powerful message that we are united and that we will use our collective resources to ensure donor assistance reaches its intended recipients. Looking forward, USAID OIG has 22 planned and ongoing oversight projects related to Ukraine. This work aligns with USAID's major programs, objectives, and funding in Ukraine. Internally, in furtherance of our oversight work, we are recruiting surge capacity staff, enhancing our data analytics program, working to add permanent IG positions in Kyiv, and we are continuing to develop products that will provide timely information to policymakers. As the head of USAID's Office of Inspector General, Congress and the American people have my commitment to independent, transparent, and timely oversight of USAID's Ukraine response. Further, I am committed to helping lead with Diana and Rob our interagency working group Together, we will ensure a comprehensive, efficient, and whole-of-government approach to our work. Thank you for your support of USAID OIG. I look forward to your questions in the discussion today. Oh, thank you for that testimony. Um, I now recognize Mr. Storch for his opening statement. Good morning, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, <clears throat> and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the DOD Office of the Inspector General's ongoing robust oversight of U.S. security assistance to Ukraine. Together with our colleagues from the Department of State, OIG, and the U.S. Agency for International Development, OIG, and the other members of the 20 agency strong oversight working group, we are actively engaged in a whole of government approach to ensure comprehensive, independent oversight across the full range of U.S. assistance to Ukraine. In January, as has been mentioned, we published our Joint Strategic Oversight Plan for Ukraine, and just yesterday, we publicly released a congressionally mandated report updating the status of our joint oversight efforts. As IGs, our offices conduct oversight through two basic means, programmatic audits, evaluations, and other reviews, and investigations into allegations of fraud, waste, abuse, and other criminal conduct. Since the 2022 invasion, the DOD OIG has issued five programmatic reports related to U.S. security assistance to Ukraine, including two management advisories that identified areas of concern that we found could impact the DOD's ability to transparently track and report the supplemental funds appropriated for Ukraine, and our most recent report in which we made recommendations to assist the Army with its maintenance, inventory, and other processes for pre-positioned equipment in the region. We currently have some 21 ongoing and planned projects that cover the full spectrum of what is essentially a train and supply mission for the DOD, focusing on, among other things, ensuring that tax dollars are used properly, that there's appropriate accountability for weapons and other materiel, and that U.S. stocks are appropriately replenished so they're available should they be needed elsewhere. 
Our ongoing and planned projects address critical issues, like planned projects address critical issues, like security and accountability controls for the transport of weapons and equipment, intelligence sharing, the replenishment of U.S. weapons stockpiles, controls for validating and responding to requests for support, the maintenance and, maintenance and sustainment of weapons provided, the training of Ukrainian soldiers to use those weapons, awards of non-competitive contracts, and the DOD's execution of funds appropriated to assist Ukraine. As our work is authoritative because we follow rigorous established standards and processes, I can't release the results of our oversight projects prior to their completion, but I want to assure you that we at the DOD OIG are committed to being as agile as possible in bringing our oversight to fruition and as transparent as possible in making the results of that work available to the Congress and the public. One area in which my office has been and will continue to be laser focused is end use monitoring, known as EUM, and enhanced end use monitoring, or EEUM, which is the DOD's tracking of military assistance and sensitive equipment after those assets are transferred to other countries. As an independent overseer of the DOD, the OIG does not conduct EUM or EEUM. But as early as 2020, we issued a report on how the DOD was conducting EEUM of military assistance to Ukraine. Last October, with the fighting ongoing, we issued a classified report in which we determined at a high level that the DOD was unable to provide such monitoring in accordance with the then existing policy because of the limited U.S. presence in Ukraine. And we outlined the actions the DOD was taking to account for the U.S. equipment provided in such circumstances. As the situation has continued to evolve, we are now actively engaged in our third evaluation of EUM, EEUM in Ukraine, and we will continue to focus on this important area, looking for opportunities to use agile reporting to release our findings and recommendations in a timely and transparent manner. In addition to this robust slate of programmatic reviews, the DOD OIG's Defense Criminal Investigative Service is actively engaged in conducting fraud prevention and investigative activ activities, leveraging its existing relationships and experience conducting investigations in combat environments around the world to ensure the integrity of U.S. assistance to Ukraine. While I cannot, of course, comment on any ongoing investigations, based on our completed work, we have not substantiated any instances of the diversion of U.S. security assistance to Ukraine. The DOD OIG has more than 90 professionals engaged in oversight of security assistance to Ukraine, including some 20 positions forward deployed in the region, and we are seeking to establish a persistent presence at the embassy in Kyiv to further our future oversight work. Working hand in glove with our oversight partners, my office will continue to make robust, independent oversight of U.S. assistance to Ukraine a matter of the highest priority for as long as the conflict and the need for oversight continue. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Storch. I, I'll start with you. And I, I'm, as I said in my opening statement, I'm very, um, you know, from day one when we had the very first supplemental package, I think putting these mechanisms in place with three inspector generals, uh, a Deloitte audit, um, you know, that's really, really the way to do this is, is right at the beginning, not at the tail end. So, uh, you know, I'm pleased that we were able to make that, that uh, progress. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was in uh, Poland and Ukraine about a month ago, and I went to the 101st Airborne where the logistics of all the weapons are going in country. It's, and it's quite fascinating. Um, to see that am amount of NATO weapons from all different countries being, you know, merged together, you know, in a pipeline, and then the communications with the Ukrainians, also with the parts and, and repairs, and uh, I mean, it was, uh, I don't think uh, the United States has ever been engaged in anything quite like this. Um, you know, in the weapons, um, I, was, I was assured that there is a system of, of barcoding with the weapons and in-use monitoring. Could you explain uh, that process uh, to the members? Thank you, thank you very much for the question. As you say, it really is remarkable to see the efforts that are being made to transport such large volumes of equipment and increasingly sophisticated equipment um, and to get it to the battlefield uh, in a timely fashion. And then as you say, to ensure appropriate uh, maintenance and sustainment as well. 
One of the things that DOD, based on our work, has emphasized, and we've been overseeing to make sure they emphasize, is the accountability of that assistance throughout that supply chain, right? So starting when the material first heads out, watching as it's transported throughout the process, as it gets over into Europe, and then it's transported on into Ukraine. And as you say, one of the things that the DOD has testified about, and frankly we're looking at in our ongoing review of EUM and EUM, is this system of barcoding that's been put in place to help to track the equipment once it enters into the country. So that's an area that is that the, the department has been exploring. We looked back in 2020 in our initial EUM uh, evaluation at the earlier stages of that. It's now moved forward, and we're continuing to look at that in our ongoing evaluation. Yeah, and, and, and any, any ways that we can even improve upon what is already, I think, a, a good system, please let me know. I, um, when I was there at that time, they said there had been no illicit diversion of U.S. weapons transferred to Ukraine. Does that still remain the case? Uh, as, as I said, based on our substantiated work, um, we have not substantiated any instances of diversion. And with regard to the improvements in the system, I just say that's a big part of why we do this work, right? We're looking for compliance, but we're also looking for ways to improve the economy, the efficiency, and the effectiveness of what, in my case, the DOD is doing with this. So we're absolutely focused on that, and we'll continue to report on it as transparently as we possibly can. Hey, Ms. Ms. Angarell, I am uh, glad to see that our European partners are starting to finally step up to the plate, I think they could do more. Um, I think Eastern Euro European uh, NATO allies have, have borne the brunt of this and because it's in their backyard. I think the Western NATO countries could do a better job uh, stepping up. And we've seen, you know, some countries do this. You know, Japan is, is uh, one of the top givers now, right? And, and um, um, I think uh, we're going to continue to press them. I don't think the United States should bear the, the burden of this um, war and responsibility when it's in their own backyard. And I know that's not part of your job description, but I just make that as a statement. Um, but um, for U.S. direct budget support to Ukraine, can you tell us about the existing accounting mechanisms in place, and have you seen any misuse or fraud in these uh, funds? Thank you for your question. Um, I'll start at the end uh, to state that from our substantiated work that we've done thus far, we have not identified any instances of fraud or misuse um, with respect to the direct budget support. Um, starting at the beginning, there is a multi-tiered um, response and oversight framework in place with many different organizations reporting and providing oversight, starting with the government of Ukraine and the Ministry of Finance. The US government's direct budget support is going through the World Bank through three different trust funds. The major um, one where the majority of money is going through is operated on a reimbursement basis. So once expenditures are made and they are determined to be eligible by the government of Ukraine, they are then submitted to the World Bank and the World Bank reviews those expenditures for eligibility as the trustee. On top of that, as you mentioned, USAID, the agency, is doing its own oversight and monitoring as the owner of this programming and the, the agency in which the money is flowing through. They have contracted with Deloitte, um, as you mentioned, to do capacity building and monitoring in Ukraine to help build up the internal capacity of the government of Ukraine um, to do that work. Additionally, USAID has partnered with GAO, the agency, not the IG, um, to do uh, capacity building and training for the external auditors and the Supreme Audit um, Agency within Ukraine. On top of that, um, USAID OIG is providing oversight. And where our role is important is looking at the complex structure that's in place and identifying any gaps, any weaknesses, and most importantly, in pro providing an independent assessment of the monitoring and the reporting that's being done. So to date, our office has issued three reports already on direct budget assistance, and we have two um, being worked on right now. Um, and additionally, we have memorandums of understanding, USAID, OIG, with the World Bank, um, their integrity office, and their internal audit office, so that we have ease of access and constant discussions with their internal compliance um, and investigative bodies. So in all of those areas, um, there are multiple people performing oversight, and our job as the independent body is to assess that oversight. Well, thank you. I, I think putting these mechanisms in place from day one, it has really helped prevent, you know, ounce of prevention's worth a pound of 
Cure has really helped prevent, I think, uh, fraud, waste, and abuse, and that, that's why I think we're getting these these positive reports from from all three of you. Um, so with that, I now recognize the the acting ranking member, Ms. Manning. Thank you very much, Ms. Thank you very much, much Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is in our national interest and in the interest of the free world that the United States, our allies, and our partners continue to provide robust support for the government and the people of Ukraine. We must stand firmly with a strong democratic Ukraine against the brutal war of aggression by Russia and its autocratic leader, Putin. Uh, in order to ensure that the support we provide is as effective as possible, it's critical that we have strong and timely oversight. And I appreciate the detailed oversight mechanisms that you have each outlined in your testimony, as well as the coordination among you that is evident. Ms. Shaw, one thing that is essential for proper oversight is sufficient and well-trained professional staff. And you stated in your testimony that you need increased staffing, but are hampered by the current selection and appointment requirements, which add months to the onboarding process for new hires, and that this issue needs a legislative solution. Can you describe that problem as well as the kind of legislative solution you would like to see? Thank you so much for that question. Um, absolutely, having the qualified professionals on staff to do this work is incredibly important. We are so fortunate at State OIG to have a very dedicated, very talented staff. Uh, but we have a global mission, and Ukraine is just a part of that. And so we have to make sure that we're staffed and resourced in a way that allows us to give the attention that is required to the situation in Ukraine while still advancing our global mission. Um, as you said, some of the uh, federal government hiring uh, authorities that we currently have do take a long time to onboard people. And so what we're looking for are um, flexible hiring authorities, the sorts of hiring authorities that we have in the context of overseas contingency operations, the ability to bring on temporary and surge staff to support this work. Um, and something else that I think uh, could be important is extending the period of availability of the supplemental funding that we have been given, um, that, that is set to expire in fiscal, at the end of fiscal year 24, and I think we expect that our oversight role will extend beyond that. Um, and so to get the right people on board and to get them engaged in doing this work, I think we would be looking both for those um, direct hiring and flexible hiring authorities, as well as potentially um, an extension of the period of availability of the existing supplemental funds. And in your opinion, would these changes require legislation or would, are these administrative issues that can be that can be addressed with, with rule changes or agency changes? My understanding is that they would, at least some of them would require a legislative solution. And so we've, we've actually um, been in contact with uh, subcommittees to talk about what that language might look like. And Inspector General Storch, do you experience the same issue and would you agree that this needs a legislative solution? So um, thank you thank you for the question, first of all, and let me thank you as well for the support that we've gotten from Congress, uh, which we've been putting to good use and carrying out our oversight. Uh, like Diana, we have a lot of things going on. Ukraine is very much our job one, um, and that support has enabled us to do that while maintaining all of our other oversight responsibilities. In terms of future hiring flexibilities, um, in our case, we're probably not quite as, um, don't need quite as many different ones as um, state perhaps, but we have identified one area um, where there could be some additional flexibility in the area of direct hiring authority that would be of assistance. And we also have been engaged with the Hill to talk about what that would look like. That would need also legislation as well, but it's something that would be helpful just to enable us to be a little bit more agile um, and flexible in, in uh, getting staff on board. Um, so I thank you for the question. Thank you. And Ms. Angarella, I notice you're nodding your head. Is this an issue in your, in your capacity as well? Yes, um, I, I would, you know, not to restate what Diana and um, Rob both said, but it, it's probably worth a little bit of an exclamation point that staffing, we spend our money through staff as IGs. That's what we do. Um, and so when we are, are graciously appropriated money to do our important work, bringing on staff is how we spend the money and do the work. And so any flexibilities we can have that can expedite our ability to bring on experienced staff would help us do that work. Thank you. And Ms. Shaw, are you concerned at all that the, the staffing issues that you've just outlined 
um, that are required to, to provide oversight in this area um, are, are that you are at risk of having to take your eye off the ball in other areas that Department of State deals with. So I'm glad to say that I don't think that that is a risk that has materialized, um, but it is something that we're keeping a close eye on. And so it's, it's not a situation we want to find ourselves in, which is why we're giving so much thought to this situation right now. Um, I'm confident that we'll be able to meet our global mission and the demands of oversight with respect to the situation in Ukraine, but any help that we can get on this regard will just help us do that more efficiently and more quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our witnesses. My time has expired and I yield back. Gentlemen, no yields. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Smith. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you calling this very important hearing. Uh, this is an issue that's on the minds of many of our constituents. They want to make sure that the money is being very well utilized uh, with total transparency. And again, I want to thank our our three inspector generals for your leadership. Uh, aggressive oversight obviously uh, mitigates criminality. It also uh, in encourages the proper use of, of scarce resources. So thank you so very much uh, for that leadership. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, one of them would be, Ms. Anna Gorella, you had mentioned uh, that there were no serious criminal findings. And I wonder if you could just explain to the committee uh, how you define serious and maybe some examples of what other types of criminality or what you thought was um, didn't rise to the level of serious but is, is a problem. I would also... Uh, all of you, what were the lessons learned from Iraq? We had IGs there, obviously, and a lot of money went the wrong way and went wayward. Um, and, um, and I'm sure you've taken into account um, all the years to date work that hopefully leads to a better uh, uh, bit of work. And then um, the IGs from other countries, including NATO, uh, how do you collaborate with them uh, to ensure that, particularly when funds and weapon systems and the like are harmonized with our NATO partners, that it's all being uh, that their portion, are, are they doing their due diligence like you are to ensure that it's all well spent? Thank you for your question. Um, what I mean by serious findings uh, is after a process of thorough investigative work or audit work um, done to the standards that my IG counterpart Storch described in his statement, um, are, are followed through with. So at, to date, we have not substantiated any allegations uh, we have two open investigations and five that are in the preliminary stages where we're doing more due diligence um, and taking additional investigative steps to see if they meet the level um, of investigative resources. So, but they have not been substantiated. Um, and by serious, the example that I gave of uh, the collusive bidding scheme, which was reported to us by one of USAID's um, major contractors that are working in Ukraine, is an example of a, a common fraud scheme that we see in, in, in USAID's programming around the world. And in that instance, the contractor identified it before they made the subaward to the collusive bidder. Um, on your last question, which I think is really important about NATO or for USAID's perspective, um, other bilateral donor uh, coordination, that is a huge uh, percentage of the time and resources we spend doing as USAID OIG. Um, much of USAID's work is different than other IG um, offices, including ones that I've worked at, in our work is done overseas. It's not done in the United States. So we absolutely have to coordinate and communicate with other donor countries and specifically their oversight organizations. So we have long-standing relationships and memorandums of understanding in place with other bilateral donors, such as the EU Anti-Corruption uh, Unit, OLAF, um, and also with UN organizations, because significant amounts of USAID's programming is done through UN organizations. We have similar MOUs and relationships and collaboration in place with the UN organizations. For example, WFP, I just returned um, with my staff from Rome, meeting with um, and re-signing an MOU with the WFP IG, uh, as well as meeting with Ambassador McCain and talking about oversight and collaboration issues. So it's a key part of us doing our work effectively. Let me, yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to add, it, it, with the part that you opened up to all of us, what I agree with everything Nicole said, and would, would just add as well 
that, you know, one of the things I think that we've learned around the world, and the chairman referred to this at the very beginning, is the importance of getting in early and getting established early and doing the oversight. So Iraq was way before my time at, as the DODIG. But having said that, one of the things we've really been stressing, and I think you heard it in all of our uh, opening statements, is the importance of coordinating early, working together up front to get ahead of oversight um, so that we're not playing catch up later. So that's, that's one important lesson. And then the other one is coordinating amongst ourselves and with our partners. Um, and all of our offices have robust relationships with, we have our own law enforcement, we have law enforcement all over the world that we have established relationships with. And that's, that's really important as well. And then the final thing I'd add is, we've learned a lot by doing oversight in conflict situations about what are the type of risks that are presented. Um, some of it on the front end, things like contracting type risks and things like that when there's a lot going on in a short period of time. And how do you get in front of that? So for instance, my office has literally done dozens dozens of uh, fraud briefings in, in the region where we've gone out and talked to folks who are engaged in this about what to look for. So I think we've learned a lot. I'm out of time, but just maybe sometime during the course of your answers, in-country risk to your forward deployed investigators, uh, have any been hurt? Uh, uh, and what is the risk factor that they, and, and again, that's very courageous work they're doing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, gentleman yields back, uh, chair recognizes Mr. Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to today's witnesses for your testimony and for your written testimony as well, which I've studied very carefully. Russia's illegal and unwarranted brutal invasion of Ukraine marks the largest land war in Europe since World War II and the biggest threat to democracy since the Cold War. Vladimir Putin thought he could divide the West, but he was sorely wrong. And now today, more than a year since the invasion began, the West remains united in our commitment to Ukraine's democracy and territorial sovereignty. President Biden and his administration restored America's standing on the world stage and helped unite NATO and the West to provide Ukraine with help they needed to protect their country and stand up to authoritarianism. Over the last year, the United States and our allies have provided military, economic, and humanitarian assistance to our Ukrainian allies in their fight for freedom. Military assistance has given brave Ukrainians on battlefields across their country the tools needed to fight back Russian forces. Economic or direct budget assistance has been deployed through the World Bank to help pay the salaries of healthcare workers, teachers, and pensioners, allowing the Ukrainian government to focus on providing basic services to its citizens and winning the war. And humanitarian assistance has been critical in delivering safe drinking water, emergency food, generators, and medical equipment to vulnerable Ukrainians across their country. These different sources of funding represent the comprehensive approach that the Biden administration is taking to ensure that Ukrainian families have access to basic services while their loved ones risk their lives in defense of their country. Throughout our nation's history, we've learned a lot from U.S. involvement in conflicts abroad about the importance of having robust oversight of foreign assistance, ensuring that dollars are being used for the prescribed purposes. The Biden administration and the Ukrainian government understand the need for trust and accountability just as much as we do. It's important to note that for Ukrainians, the very existence of their country and identity is at stake. So they have a vested interest in rooting out corruption and any person who would jeopardize further foreign assistance. That is why, since the beginning of this conflict, both the Biden administration and the Ukrainian government have emphasized the need to prioritize accountability by creating layers of oversight. For example, USAID currently provides direct budget support through the World Bank within the Public Expenditures for Administrative Capacity Endurance, or the PEACE program. That program only allows for funds to be sent to projects within a pre-approved expenditure category that have been verified as an actual expenditure. These funds can only be sent on reimbursement, meaning that none of this funding can be spent discretionarily. The Peace Program has additional auditing and reporting requirements built into it, which serves as additional accountability mechanisms. In addition, USAID has recruited the firm Deloitte, an independent third party, to oversee the use of funds by the Ukrainian government. The Government Accountability Office Center for Audit Excellence has created a new partnership with the Ukrainian government to strengthen the ability of Ukraine's own auditing institutions. And today, Inspectors General of the State Department, Department of Defense, and USAID have shared the work they are carrying out every day to oversee their respective departments and agencies to ensure both transparency and accountability. The Biden administration and the Ukrainians know just how important it is to build trust to show the American taxpayers where their dollars are going. That's why they've taken extraordinary steps to build upon existing mechanisms and to create new ones to establish even more transparency and accountability. Our work to support Ukraine here in Congress has been largely bipartisan because we, especially those on this committee, understand what is at stake 
if Vladimir Putin is successful in this war. And it is my hope that we can continue to support the people of Ukraine in the same way as they fight for their freedom. And I really want to use my time to thank the witnesses for the work that they are doing and leading this effort uh, to establish without question the prudent, effective, and proper use of American funding uh, for this effort to protect democracy. And I'll just ask Ms. Andrella, um, if you would just um, maybe briefly describe in the time that's left why this reimbursable model is so effective in ensuring proper oversight of funding in, in the war context. Sure, thank you for your question. Um, I'll start by saying as the IG, we didn't have a role in determining the mechanism or setting any policy um, for how it would be done. From a subject matter sort of expertise um, level, the reimbursement mechanism, as you so accurately described, is on eligible um, expenditures. And so what that allows our office to do is to review the reports and to assess from an independent standpoint whether the expenditures were eligible. Um, so so that, that mechanism that was chosen by the decision makers um, gives us the flexibility uh, to look at specific expenditures as opposed to just dollars going into a general account. Thank you so much, and thank you again for all of your work, the three of you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The woman yields. Chair recognizes Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start out by saying that no one on this committee, no one in America, left or right, agrees with the actions, the decisions of Vladimir Putin or Russia regarding Ukraine. Let me just say that outright. Uh, to Mr. Storch, um, you know, I think it would surprise many Americans to know that, that the financial assistance that the United States has provided eclipses this, what's so, the so-called security assistance, the, the ammunition, the weapons, et cetera. Uh, to the tune of about $26.4 billion from what I gather here. At the very same moment where we're in extraordinary measures in the United States regarding our own fiscal posture, where the Civil Service Retirement and Disability Fund is suspended, where the Postal Service Retiree Health Benefit Fund is suspended, and we're literally funding the pensions and the operation of government in Ukraine. Can you give us assurance that None of that money is in, in, that's being sent to arguably one of the most, if not the most corrupt uh, country on the planet is being misused, misspent, lost, malfeasance, gone to, gone to oligarchs or special individuals connected to, you know, the, the, the government, et cetera. What assurance can you give the American people? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, first of all, it's, it's my understanding that of the $113 billion that the Congress has appropriated to date uh, for Ukrainian assistance, over $62 billion, I think it's 62.3, has gone to security assistance. Um, and that's really the area in which my office performs oversight, although very much hand in glove with my colleagues from state AID and the rest of the 20 member strong oversight working group. Um, and we work every day. Uh, to ensure that we're doing robust oversight, I both get it. the sort of programmatic reviews and the so, investigations. So, so we get no assurance, and, and I understand you're working with your partners, but you can give us no assurance. Is that generally the answer? Well, so, so what I've testified to, Congressman, is that uh, based on our completed work, we have not substantiated any instances of diversion of U.S. security assistance okay. to Ukraine. Right. And, now, and it took us years in Afghanistan to establish that as well, but I need to, I need to move on. Ms. Shaw... Um, the Global Engagement Center's mission is to focus on foreign disinformation. Would you agree with that? Yes, I believe that's accurate. That's their mandate, right? So is a government agency authorized to violate the First Amendment rights of U.S. citizens? That's a legal question. No, I, really. You, have, you've read the Constitution. Is a government is a government agency or is the federal government of which this would be an agency authorized to violate the First Amendment rights of United States citizens? I don't believe so. I don't believe so either. Are they, is a government agency allowed to subcontract or contract out the abrogation or the violation of the First Amendment rights of U.S. citizens? If they can't do it themselves because it would be against the law, are they allowed to contract that out or subcontract that out? What do you think? I'm sorry, this is not within the purview of our oversight work, and we don't have work that looks squarely at this issue. 
So you don't, you're, as, the, as the IG for state, you don't look at the Global Engagement Center. That wouldn't be under your purview. We do look at the Global Engagement Center. We have published work from, I believe, 2020 looking specifically at that program. All right, so you're familiar with the fact that they have themselves engaged Twitter to blacklist uh, U.S. citizens under the guise of foreign disinformation or have engaged partners that they have funded to do the same thing. Are you familiar with that? And would that be a problem if you, if you, if you knew that, if your agency knew that? I am familiar with those allegations, yes. But you have not looked into them? No, we have not. Uh, so if it's true, if it is true that they have either engaged directly or engaged indirectly through outside partners, some of which they have provided grant money to, which, what, would be, what would be the appropriate response from the inspector general regarding that kind of activity, which would actually literally be um, subverting and denying the civil rights of Americans? So offices of inspector general do investigate allegations of criminal conduct, violations of law, and so that is something that would be within our purview. Um, I do believe that I, I'm aware that this is also the subject of ongoing litigation, uh, and so that also is uh, an element to this. But uh, yes, we do look at viol potential. And if they have violated it, and knowing that they're up for funding and reauthorization, would you recommend, as the Inspector General, that they not be reauthorized if they are involved in this criminal conduct against American citizens? I'm sorry, I don't have a position on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Gentleman yields back. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Barra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, normally don't do this, but you know, I would just like to correct my good friend and colleague from Pennsylvania. While there may be a history of corruption in Ukraine, Russia is a much more corrupt country. And we've seen the actions of Vladimir Putin and the moral corruption of Vladimir Putin. So let's correct the record. Russia has demonstrated their corruption here. And you know, I applaud the chairman and ranking member for holding this hearing, because it is important for us to do oversight. It is important for us to defend democracies and the sovereignty of nations like Ukraine. And you know, I'm proud of the work that we've done on the Foreign Affairs Committee in a bipartisan way, as well as in Congress, standing up for this illegal war and illegal invasion um, that Vladimir Putin is executing and the moral corruption that we're seeing. I'm glad that the International Criminal Court has deemed him a, a, a war criminal because of what he's doing to, to children, kidnapping them, removing them from their parents, reprehensible. Ms. Shaw, um, let me ask a cu couple questions. Um, and if this is not in your purview as the um, Inspector General, certainly let me know. You have oversight of the, um, of the embassy in Kyiv. Um, I'm curious how, obviously we evacuated the embassy in the early days of the invasion. We've stood that up again how things are going, how operations are, and the safety of our men and women that are you know, representing us in, in Kyiv. Thank you for that question. Um, this is something that is uh, of vital importance to us in terms of our oversight. As I mentioned, uh, management and operations is one of the three strategic areas that we're focusing on. We actually have a series of work ongoing right now that, as I said, will start with the shuttering of the embassy in February 2022 to its reopening to its current operating status. And while I don't want to get out ahead of those um, findings until we've completed that work, we did have the opportunity to meet with embassy officials in Kyiv. Uh, we were at the embassy. Um, I am glad to report that at least at that time, uh, everybody was well, uh, but obviously they're operating under very challenging circumstances. Um, uh, sort of stepping out more broadly beyond just safety, you know, there are security issues that uh, in a wartime setting have to be considered. Uh, we did just issue a classified management alert uh, with some technical security issues that we identified at the embassy and were able to put forward some recommendations that we think will help address those and ensure the security of the operations at the embassy. Um, but I look forward to publishing our, our completed uh, body of work on this question, um, which I think will be very illuminating in terms of how it's operating. Great. And again, um, if this, uh, you know, second question, if this is not part of the, the Inspector General, certainly let me know. In the early days of the invasion, we obviously saw refugee flows coming out of um, Ukraine, women and children um, particularly. Um, Mike. My district, Sacramento County, has a large Ukrainian-American population, obviously. Um, 
you know, that, that are very concerned about, you know, relatives and, and, and family that are, that are coming out. In your perspective, doing oversight of the visa process, the um, humanitarian parole process, et cetera, can you give us an assessment of how that's working, if there's things that we should be thinking about in Congress? Um, and again, not from a policy perspective, just from an oversight perspective. So we, we do have ongoing work looking at uh, the department's deployment of humanitarian aid. Um, and the department uh, has a large role in assisting refugees. Um, so again, don't want to get out ahead of the findings in that work, but we are putting out an information brief. Uh, it'll be published next month that's looking specifically at how those funds are being deployed to which of its nine implementing partners and what needs are being addressed by that. And I think that might help um, uh, answer some of your questions. Great. Thank you. Um, and just in my remaining time, Mr. Storch, I, I think you called it the, the end use monitoring EU. Um, um, Obviously, I have to imagine it's difficult in a wartime situation, you know, on the front lines and, and so forth, to check the accuracy and, and you know, make, making sure how, how those munitions are, are used. Again, if you can't answer this question in this setting, um, just let me know. Are we contracting with Ukrainians to do some of the work, uh, or are, are we deploying personnel um, to do some of that, that monitoring on the front lines? So I appreciate the question, and yes, you're right. I mean, for instance, the point that the chairman made about using scanners, right? One of the things that uh, the American uh, military has done in, in a difficult situation is, is tried to figure out alternatives as to how to uh, comply with EUM requirements and ensure the accountability of the, of the material that's being uh, provided. The details of that, as I think your question uh, uh, suggested, some of that's classified. That's why our October 2022 report was classified. So I can't get into that, but I will say as we look at that, uh, one of the things we're doing as an oversight entity is looking at the alternatives are, that are being I I employed and trying to make recommendations as to how to do that as effectively as possible in what is, as you say, a wartime situation. Great. My time's expired. I yield back. Joan, uh, time has expired. Chair now recognizes Mr. Mast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I want to talk as well about uh, just to ask some questions about end use monitoring um, to you, sir. And so as we're looking at some of the weapon systems, what to you are the most high priority weapon systems, both coming from the United States and from NATO EU at large uh, for us to be paying attention to in terms of end use monitoring? Well, um, we're paying attention to everything, but you're right. I was, we prioritize. <laughs> that's that's. A, I was trying to figure out how to say that tactfully, Congressman. Yeah, no. So um, it's important that the that the government pay attention to everything, and that the distinction between the EUM, the end use monitoring, and the EEUM is the EUM tends to involve systems that have more sensitive technologies, uh, such that the government has seen fit to require enhanced monitoring in terms of security plans, in terms of trying to. Uh, get uh, serial number verification or use alternative means to try to get the information necessary to do that as opposed to the EUM, which still is monitored, but monitored under a, a sort of a, a more general approach. Um, so, so the type of uh, systems that are under EUM, and there's a list of them that include these sort of things, include things like the, the Javelin missiles, um, the uh, ARAMs, the advanced medium range air-to-air -air missiles, uh, the, the night vision devices, some of those are still on there, stinger missiles, grip stocks, things like that um, are some of the ones that are subject to EEUM, the more enhanced monitoring. Now, when you look at that enhanced monitoring, how does that blur into tactical fielding of these weapons? And would end use monitoring include whether Ukrainians chose to use a weapon system uh, offensively in a Russian space instead of in sovereign Ukrainian territory. Is that your purview? So um, our purview is to do oversight over the DOD's monitoring of the equipment. And the purpose of the monitoring is to ensure the accountability of the weapons and, and so to determine where they're located and, and where, they're, where they're being used. And to ensure not misuse. Essentially. And so the nature of my question is, under your purview, is it misuse 
for them to use a weapon offensively against Russia in Russians border in within Russia's borders. So I appreciate the under your purview because that's not really within our purview. The use of the equipment is is subject to agreements uh, between the United States and donor countries all over the world, including Ukraine. My understanding is whenever our country provides weaponry to foreign countries, there are agreements as to how that weapon the weaponry is supposed to be used. And the purpose of the end use monitoring is to ensure that the foreign country is following through. Oh, perfect. I appreciate the uh, information on that. That was the nature of my questions. You've exhausted them. And in that, Mr. Chairman, I yield the remainder of my time. Gentleman uh, yields back. Uh, chair recognizes ranking member, Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our support to Ukraine is uh, vital to keeping the state institutions uh, and re local and regional governments operating, preventing uh, societal collapse. And we are helping keep hospitals and schools open as uh, Ukraine's war fighters defend the Ukrainian people because uh, they're, uh, they're fighting for their right to exist, actually. And, uh, you know, I've been on this committee for both the wars in Iraq, the wars in Afghanistan. So I want to ask about what sort of recipient government and society are we dealing with in Ukraine? Uh, Ms. Shaw, can you, test, can you describe the ability and willingness of the Ukrainian government to assist in oversight efforts? And uh, well, let me just ask you that. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, so I would say that we're in the early stages of establishing our relationships with the Ukrainian officials. Um, we did uh, have the opportunity to meet with a number of important people when we were there in January. Um, so we have a strong foundation. Uh, there was broad willingness on our trip in our conversations with others to open the books, to allow our oversight in. Um, so we were very encouraged by that, but of course we need to follow through. Um, and so we're working very hard to develop those relationships, um, both within the Ukrainian government, but also in law enforcement and prosecutorial entities. I think establishing um, uh, and securing positions at Embassy Kyiv will be vitally important in part because that allows us to further deepen those relationships, which will be critical when the time comes if there is fraud or corruption identified to actually ensure accountability. So what you see now, do you see any uh, weaknesses in their, at least their efforts or at all in complying? So we haven't assessed their efforts to date, but I would say that we did not, uh, or I should put it this way, uniformly the people that we met with who would be the critical players for our oversight work were very open to working with us and we've continued to see that sort of willingness as we've explored these relationships further. And. Uh, let me go to, um, you know, this committee has, has received uh, dozens of briefings and documents and consistent updates on the extensive uh, security assistance provided to Ukraine's military as well as the Department of State's and Defense's integrated approach to uh, ensuring the utmost accountability and transparency. And I want to note for the record that, uh, and for all members that are present here, that these extensive documents uh, and details are on our assistance remain available in our committee's secure spaces. And I hope members would take advantage of that so that they can see for themselves what's happening there. But let me ask uh, Mr. Storch, uh, given your extensive experience uh, working in investigatory settings uh, with the U.S. government agencies, could you describe your views on the nature of U.S. accountability and oversight over security assistance provided to Ukraine? Thank you very much for the question, Congressman. Um, I would say this has been an, a truly extraordinary effort from the very beginning on the part of not just my office, but my counterparts from state and USAID, and really the larger working group. It really is remarkable to see the way everybody has come together to ensure that, as uh, Diana said, we're covering the waterfront, that there aren't any gaps in terms of the oversight we're doing on both the programmatic level, as I talked about, in terms of audits and evaluations, and on the investigative side. Our folks, when I said we're working hand in glove, we really are working hand in glove to make sure that there's comprehensive, robust oversight over all aspects of assistance. And so 
Um, I think it, it truly has, has been remarkable. One thing I'd also add is that all of our offices have vast experience in doing this sort of oversight in similar settings. This is, every, every situation is different. Um, one of the things about this that's different, I mentioned, is that this is essentially a train and supply mission. So for DOD, the vast majority of that mission takes place before this, the material or weapons ever gets to Ukraine, right? But we do oversight throughout, and then to the earlier question, when the material goes over, we're doing oversight to make sure that DOD is doing everything possible to do the end use monitoring, enhance end use monitoring in the situation. So and all of that is going on on a robust scale. So, so uh, is there any evidence thus far of Ukraine uh, diverting or otherwise losing U.S. provided security assistance? Uh, and, uh, and finally, how is the uh, 3IG effort uh, examining an existing U.S. accountability mechanisms uh, in use of monitoring activities as the conditions uh, in Ukraine evolve? So um, we have not, uh, at uh, DOD OIG, we have not substantiated any instances of diversion of U.S. security assistance. Uh, obviously, we will continue to explore any allegations that are made um, and uh, of any sort of uh, waste, fraud, abuse, or misconduct of any kind. Um, and in terms of how the oversight is working, um, it's ongoing. We've got, as I mentioned, the third EUM, EUM project going right now. We're looking to do some agile reporting so we can get out some management advisories early on while that project is continuing because uh, we're doing oversight at the speed of war, right? Um, and then as we're, we look to the future, we're already starting to plan for the next EUM, EUM um, evaluation. One of the things we learned from our trip over there, and it just makes common sense, is this situation is evolving rapidly, um, and that requires us as oversight entities to be agile in doing that oversight. So we're we're doing that, and we're going to keep doing it. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Chair recognizes Mr. Isa. Thank you. Um, I want to start off with it's a little outside the box question, but. Uh, 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 Ms. Shaw, you're uh, currently acting. How long have you been acting? Since December of 2020. And uh, the same for uh, Ms. Ag Aguilala? Since June 1st of 2022. Okay. And you're confirmed. When were you confirmed? I was confirmed on November 30th of last year. Okay. So you're confirmed. Your job does not serve quite as solely at the pleasure. For the other two of you, uh, my understanding is you could be replaced at any time either by a confirmation or by simply a selection that they take somebody else. Is that right? Uh, in my case, certainly a, a nomination and a confirmation would ensure a permanent inspector general and I would revert back to my role as deputy inspector general. And they did not, uh, they did not, they have not named one at uh, state, is that right? There's not currently a nominee. How about at USAID? We do not currently have a nominee and the same would apply to, to me. I would go back to my permanent role as the general counsel to the inspector general. Okay, but permanent role as, as general counsel does not guarantee that you'd be the selection. They could take a deputy and promote them over you today. Is that correct? To the permanent IG position, correct. Okay. I, I'm asking only because this is deja vu all over again. In the Obama administration under Hillary Clinton, there never was an IG, uh, a permanent IG. And uh, that concerns me, and I, I just want to make sure that's in the record that uh, for the three of you, I know you're doing your job, but I also know that it's a little bit easier to do your job when you go to the SIGI meeting and you know you're you don't have that acting temporary just just passing through. Uh, so here's here's the sort of back to the main line of questioning. Um, we have supplied training to more or less a hundred countries, uh, including we still supply tra training to Mongolia. We supply training to. Uh, uh, the Lebanese Armed Forces, the list, Jordanian, the list is endless. Um, is there anything special about uh, the training for these people who and, uh, and the oversight? Uh, they're in the middle of a war. The weapons we give them, by definition, could be seized, destroyed, or lost in combat to an enemy at any time. Is there really any reason that we should be, oh, boy, this is really different and so much better? Or, in fact, are we basically giving them weapons and we should only be holding them to the standard that basically it's not being diverted, for example, the way it was in Afghanistan? 
So uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I'll speak to the security aspect and then turn to my colleagues if they want to add anything. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And with regard to training, we have currently an ongoing project. So as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to get ahead of that because that's what makes our work authoritative, right, as we go through our processes. But I will say one difference with Ukraine is that um, from some prior situations is the United States is not standing up a new army and sort of training them from scratch, right? Ukraine has long had an established military, and the United States has had long experience with the Ukrainian military, um, and they've dealt with a lot of sophisticated weapons over the years. So we're providing new things to them, some more sophisticated weapons. Those require particular types of training. We're looking at that now at DODOIG to make sure that's being provided comprehensively and efficiently. But I think that's one of the big differences here is we're dealing not just with an established uh, military, but one that has you know, worked with our military over the years for many years. So uh, I'm going to say to all of you, but I'll, I'll particularly uh, move it toward DOD, from a standpoint of uh, a success story, it's fair to say that as Inspector General and uh, in the historic role that IGs play, that this is an, a continuous, evolving, and improving relationship and training, very similar to what we deal with in our own armed forces and your IGs deal with. So I'm going to lose, use the last 30 seconds for a different reason. Uh, in a few days, we'll be uh, at Arlington with General Treffrey, who, to a great extent, uh, is the father of the modern IG. Back decades ago, he was tasked to straighten out the situation with inspector generals. As a three-star general, he took the assignment, and uh, he, at 98, he'll be, he, he, he surpassed, and he will be laid to rest. But uh, as an admirer of the work that all of you do, an admirer of, of what IGs do for our country and, quite candidly, for our Congress, in uh, providing us eyes and ears, not just on what's wrong, but on the improvements and the success stories, I wanted to take a moment to honor him in addition to thanking all three of you. And Mr. Chairman, thanks for the indulgence. I yield back. It's very, very nice. Um, Chair now recognizes Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I thank the witnesses. You're some of the most straightforward, informed that we've had. I certainly don't get the impression you're just passing through and doing this casually. I think you're probably very well respected in your different departments and certainly in your field and by me and some of the members of this committee. So thank you for doing that. A couple of things seem to stand out as we go through all of this. Uh, the first is that some have kind of implied, others have said it straightforwardly, that there's not enough oversight of American tax dollars going to Ukraine. Some have threatened to cut it off because they think there's too much going, uh, because there's not enough oversight. I think that your testimony here proves that that is just not the case. There is extensive oversight, expansive oversight, a number of reports that have been done, and a number that are planned to be done. So I. I think that that should clear up that uh, question of how much oversight is going on. It's obviously considerable. Uh, some of the information that has come out is misinformation from the Russians trying to imply that the Ukrainians are not, not using the money in the right way to tr attack their credibility and I think hurt their efforts to get assistance from the U.S. Second thing that's interesting is that we're hearing we need more oversight, more oversight from the very people who want to cut the budget for oversight. Uh, these discretionary funds, right now the budgets are increased. Uh, State Department oversight, $3.6 billion. USAID oversight, $108.3 million. Uh, DOD, $740 billion. You know, this is all money in the budget for you to do more oversight, while some of our friends want to just do across-the-board cuts or cuts of discretionary funding. Could you address that? Could you do more oversight with these increased funds? Uh, or could you continue to operate if they get cut back to last year's level? So 
certainly with more funding, we can do more oversight. Um, we have to employ a risk-based approach to ensure that we're directing our resources to the highest risk, greatest impact areas. Um, but there are always dark corners that we would like to explore to pressure test to make sure that we are covering the waterfront. I'm not talking specifically about the situation in Ukraine, but more broadly, our, our, our global mission. So yes, um, there's uh, not just a, a need for that, but a plan for that if we are fortunate enough to receive those funds. And were we to be cut, um, I am concerned about our ability Ability to continue to advance this important work. Our folks are, frankly, burning the candle at both ends to meet the um, extensive mandate that we have. And it's because they are deeply personally committed to the mission that they do that. It's not because I asked them to. Uh, they see the importance of the work that we do, not just to themselves and their professional careers and the department, but to the American taxpayer. And so this is the way that we uh, approach our work every day and um, hope that uh, Congress will resource us in a way that allows us to further ex uh, expand our mission. Thank you. Yeah, I would echo exactly what Diana said. Um, I, I think that those of us that are in the oversight community have made a career of it for a reason, um, that we acknowledge that we have the ultimate responsibility for providing oversight of the funds and programming uh, within our respective agencies, and our staff are as committed to that as possible. Um, and so extra funds help provide extra oversight, help conduct additional investigations, um, but I, I think that we've been very creative and very judicious in um, addressing all of the issues that are coming in. Uh, we have hundreds of people on our staffs working specifically on Ukraine work. Um, as we bring on surge capacity, that will help. Um, but I think where there, we will figure out a way to do it because it is what we do. Thank you. Yeah, I, I could just rely on what they said, but I suppose I'll, I'll, I agree with all of it and would just add, at, at DOD OIG, we have more than 90 people right now engaged on uh, oversight related to Ukraine. Uh, about 20 of those positions are forward deployed in the region. And as has been discussed, we're looking to do more. Uh, we very much appreciate the support we've gotten from Congress that has enabled us to do all this work on top of all the other priorities we have, Indo-PACOM, use of technology. I mean, there's a whole litany of things going on at the DOD with that big budget you mentioned. And so we have a lot of oversight responsibilities. And so we're able to do everything that we feel we need to do with regard to Ukraine because of the support that we've gotten from Congress to do that. If that were to change, then that becomes difficult. You have to start making choices potentially, and hopefully we won't, we won't get there. But what we will keep doing is doing robust oversight over uh, assistance to Ukraine. Thank you, I yield back. The only way he yields back, uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Davidson. I thank the Chairman uh, for having this important hearing. It's certainly one of the top questions I get in my district uh, from people who are broadly supportive of Ukraine. They're happy about the policy, but of course, this isn't a question about the policy. This is a question about, uh, since the money has been sent, uh, what's happening to it? And, you know, Mr. Storch, I appreciate your statement up front saying, hey, zero uh, instances of diversion have been detected so far. That's not saying there are no instances, they just haven't been detected yet. Uh, <coughs> Ms. Angarella, have there been any instances detected in your investigations yet? No, as of today, um, sitting here, our work that we've substantiated and reports that we've reviewed, we have not seen instances of that. Um, yeah. But I, I would say this is the early stages. So yep. we are. Thank you. I understand to, that. And yeah. Ms. Shaw, for any in your case so far? Our completed work has not substantiated any uh, allegations of diversion. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Ms. Shaw, you, well, let me just say this. Early on, we didn't detect much in Afghanistan either, and we created. Um, an office for the special investigator for Afghan Afghanistan. Um, are there instances where that would, there are voids where that added value there? Would we benefit from the same kind of approach uh, here in Ukraine? I guess why or why not? Thank you for that question. Um, I think the model that we've developed between our uh, OIGs and the other government accountability uh, organizations that we work with on the working group is an excellent model to address this really cross-cutting interagency oversight work. Um, it's a, a collaborative model that we've used in other contexts, so we know it's sort of tried and true. It's been t uh, pressure tested, um, but we're deploying it in this context, and I think it's been very effective. And so to add another layer into that that would potentially 
potentially result in a redundant mandate, duplicative costs, mm. duplication of effort. Um, I think as an IG concerned well, with efficiency. Yeah, I understand, except that that actually worked and we weren't getting results until we did that. We weren't finding anything, not saying people weren't looking, but uh, we found a lot once we, once we created the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan. Um, Ms. Shaw, you, you broke the buckets down into three. You said security, non-security, and management and operations. Uh, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the questions I've had from constituents, which bucket of funds is paying for pensions for Ukrainian government workers and employees and citizens? Which, which U.S. dollars are paying for Ukrainian pensions? That would fall under the bucket of non-security assistance that's non -security. going out as uh, direct financial support primarily. Okay, so how do we audit that? Is the Ukrainian government effective in saying, yeah, we're only spending this much money? How's that not just paying uh, Ukrainian government officials that go shopping in Paris or whatnot? So if I may, I'd, I would actually defer to, to Nicole. Um, USAID OIG has purview over the direct uh, financial support, and I'm sure she'd be happy to answer your question. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, one of the techniques that I've mentioned previously is the reimbursement. So the money that uh, is going through the World Bank to the government of Ukraine is being done on an expenditure, a reimbursement basis. So after the um, expenses are incurred, then receipts or um, signed you know, authorization saying that this is what the money was used for is being submitted before the Yeah, but the how do you validate dispersed. that? I mean, they could give you a bill and say, yep, yeah, we had $100 million this month. Uh, here's a receipt. So that's where some... What they do with the $100 million? Yep. So that's where the different levels of uh, oversight have been are in the system right now, which is the first being the, the Ministry of Finance within the government of Ukraine, certifying those expenditures when they submit them to the World Bank. The second line is the World Bank. Um, so they basically, they promise. With expenditures and submitting the, okay. the report. All right. And of course, you know, look, not saying that they're, they're not being honest, but they don't have a lot of incentive to be honest. And, you know, we've, we've, we know there are some countries have have problems. Even in our own country, uh, people aren't always honest. And in Ukraine, we've had uh, you know they they have one of the highest uh, instances of um, I guess corruption reported in world indexes, right? So of countries we're allied with, they're they're one of the corrupt more corrupt countries. And so just promising, I think, might not be a sufficient control. Um, you know, Mr. Storch, uh, in the GAO report titled uh, DoD Financial management, uh, greater attention and needed, greater attention needed over government uh, furnished property from January of 2023, they go into detail about how over $220 billion in DOD property assets are unaccounted for. First, are the same people overseeing the Ukraine asset management? And if so, how can they be trusted given this report? They already can't account for 200 plus billion in America. So uh, our office has been very engaged with DOD uh, to do a variety of oversight, looking at their management of the Are they the finances. same people, same tools, same tools and, to get back? And as I, as I mentioned in my uh, opening statement, we did a couple of management advisories just last year, looking particularly at the way in which the systems work and the way the accounting is done with regard to the supplemental appropriations to Ukraine. We've followed up on those to see there has been progress made, but we're going to continue to follow up to ensure that the money is being accounted for. All right, let's hope we can properly. pass an audit this year. Thanks, and I yield. Gentleman yields back. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Liu. Uh, thank you, Chairman McCall and Ranking Member Meeks. I'd like to first thank all three of you for your public service and your critical work. And I will begin uh, with Inspector General Shaw. So two days ago, uh, all of you released this report, joint oversight of the Ukraine response, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And in this joint report of all three Inspector Generals, on the very first page, you say, our offices have made oversight of Ukraine response a top priority. You stand by that statement? I absolutely do. Okay. In this report, you also write, OIG investigations resulting from these and other allegations have not yet substantiated significant waste, fraud, or abuse. You stand by that statement? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, so, Inspector General uh, Argarella, I'm going to ask you the same exact questions. Uh, you signed on and produced this comprehensive report? Yes. Okay. By the way, it's very well written. It has appendixes. It uh, talks about ongoing projects and, and planned projects. 
Uh, you stand by the statement that oversight of the Ukraine response is a top priority, correct? I do. As well as a statement that you found uh, the allegations have not yet substantiated significant waste, fraud, or abuse, correct? I do. All right. Uh, Inspector General Storch, I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, you signed on to this comprehensive report about Ukraine oversight? Absolutely, and thank you for the kind words about the report. Our folks worked hard on it, sir. Thank you. And you stand by a statement that Ukraine oversight is a top priority? Absolutely. And that you found no significant waste, fraud, or abuse, correct? That's correct. All right. I, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit this report uh, into the record or acting chairman. Without objection, so ordered. Okay. Now I'm going to go through some of your individual statements. So I'll start with Inspector General Shaw. Uh, you write that state OIG has taken a strategic, agile, and coordinated approach to Ukraine response oversight, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then you further write, I have great confidence in the quality of Ukraine-related oversight work we have performed to date. You stand by that statement? I do. All right. And you say state OIG has a proven ability to conduct effective oversight in a hybrid context. You stand by that statement? Yes, I do. And to date, you have found no diversion, correct? Correct. Okay, all right. So uh, next, I'd like to talk to Inspector General Angarella. Uh, you state that in previous testimony today that you've not identified any fraud or, or misuse. Is that correct so far? Yes, correct. We have and, not substantiated and, anything. And you've not... Okay, anything, including you've not substantiated any diversion, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, you also write that I would like to conclude my remarks with insurance that as head of USAID's Office of Inspector General, Congress and American people have my commitment to independent, transparent, and timely oversight of USAID's Ukraine response. You stand by that statement? Yes, I do. Okay, all right. I'd like to move on to uh, Inspector General Storch. Uh, previously, you had testified uh, that you found no instances of diversion, correct? We have not substantiated any uh, instances of diversion. So That's when correct. the U.S. provided Ukraine, uh, for example, with Stinger missiles and javelins uh, that uh, the Ukraine military got, they weren't diverting them to Russia or North Korea or uh, Iran or any place else, correct? We have not substantiated anything like that. In fact, they were using these weapons uh, to stop their unprovoked Russian aggression. Uh, in fact, uh, the Ukrainians have been paying uh, for this equipment with their blood. I also like to uh, point out uh, that you had, in addition to saying there was no diversion, uh, that you uh, have had agile reporting and had extraordinary uh, cooperation and it's extraordinary effort with all of your um, other OIG partners. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So um, I don't really know why we're holding this hearing. I mean, they literally, these RIG inspectors literally sent out a report two days ago that answers pretty much every question uh, at this hearing. Uh, I submit we're done here. I think we should talk about more important issues, like how do we make sure other countries don't give additional assistance to Russia? How do we make sure Ukraine has a longer range weapons they need to win this war? How do we make sure Ukraine has the air assets it needs to win this war? So instead of uh, trying to respond to false right-wing talking points, by the way, this hearing totally demolished the right-wing false talking point that somehow there has been effective oversight. Not only has there been effective oversight, it's also shown that there's been no diversion uh, and no uh, significant waste, fraud, and abuse. Thank you for your public service. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We have oversight so we can make sure we trust but verify. And so we will continue the hearing despite the objection. The uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Chairman Brian Mast and uh, Ranking Member uh, Greg Meeks. And uh, we're grateful for the service of the witnesses. The people of Ukraine are under as existential threat. Putin had a treatise uh, that he published in Kremlin.com that Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, don't exist. And uh, that was August 2021. Um, with the war criminal Putin at hand, I'm grateful for the opportunity to highlight the robust oversight mechanisms that are already in place. In fact, there are 64 ongoing or planned audits and reports, which should be reassuring to the American taxpayers. Additionally, it's significant that uh, we have four countries that are actually providing more aid as percent of GDP than the United States. In fact, uh, we have a number of countries almost equal to the uh, contribution by way of GDP, and that would include Bulgaria, Norway, Czech Republic, uh, Canada, the United Kingdom, 
uh, over and over again, uh, we have uh, so many countries, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland ahead. Um, so uh, America is not alone. Uh, they, there are countries that understand that uh, truly uh, we are uh, in an existential uh, threat to ourselves, and that is that we have the global war on terrorism of 9-11, which continues. Uh, and with the open southern border, I, I'm concerned there are more risks today than ever before for American families. Additionally, I believe that we have worldwide competition uh, between democracies with rule of law being opposed by authoritarians by rule of gun. And we see that with the mass murder uh, that Putin's conducting today uh, in Ukraine. We see this with the Chinese Communist Party threatening the people of Taiwan. We see this uh, with the regime in Tehran threatening uh, death to Israel, death to America. And as they develop a nuclear capability, they really mean it. And so it's so important that we all work together for peace through strength. And that's why I'm grateful for a, a, an extraordinary uh, op-ed that uh, Ambassador Governor Nikki Haley provided on March the 6th, uh, 20th, uh, which indicates clearly China wins if Russia conquers uh, Ukraine. So what you're doing is so important, reassuring the taxpayers. And with that, uh, for our witnesses, uh, for each of you, uh, Ukrainians have every reason to make sure that American aid and military supplies are used correctly. Not just because if it's abused, the aid would likely not continue, but because American aid is saving lives. It's saving the lives of Ukrainian civilians, women, and children. It is preventing the country by being overrun by war criminal Putin. I believe that uh, if there were abuse uh, of American aid, that uh, sadly that would help Putin, and that's not a good way to be popular, obviously, hopefully, in Ukraine. So what attitudes, as you all have visited uh, with the people in Ukraine, what is the level of care uh, that you see for American aid? So uh, I'm happy to start. Um, so um, we, when we were over in Kyiv, uh, everyone with whom we met, uh, up to the uh, prime minister, the minister of defense, the minister of finance, um, the prosecutor general, everyone expressed an understanding of the importance of transparency and important of the importance of addressing corruption, and I think a realization that, uh, first of all, they need to do that to save their country. They're in, a, they're in a war. And secondly, they understand the implications they indicated to us of not uh, doing that in terms of international assistance um, for, for, the, for their country. And so we heard that message consistently from the very highest levels. Um, the prosecutor general was back in town the next week, reached out to a number of us um, to meet again, and, and I had a one-on-one -on -one with him where I talked specifically about the importance of addressing corruption um, and ensuring that's done in a meaningful, transparent way. He indicated he understood that. Um, just for what it's worth, in the world of small coincidences, I actually worked in a prior life when I was a prosecutor representing the Department of Justice as a resident legal advisor uh, to assist the people of Ukraine in addressing corruption and went back there to help them write their anti-corruption package of legislation. Um, and so I've seen the evolution that's gone on. They've told us they're committed to it. But having said that, we're IGs. We're in the trust but verify business. And so as um, Diana said earlier, we're going to continue to engage to make sure we're getting the information we need to do oversight and to make sure that they are, in fact, and, and in, Indeed, thank you for your efforts. And this has got to be reassuring to American taxpayers that uh, 64 different reports, 39 different uh, IG requests. Uh, and indeed, uh, when I was in Kiev in December, the very first group we met with were the anti-corruption organization. And so there's every effort to avoid uh, anti-corruption. Uh, and hey, what a classic case, Zelensky himself. If he'd been corrupt, when the president offered him a ride out of the country as um, Russian troops were 10 miles away coming to kill him and his wife, uh, he would have fled the country and enjoyed the fruits of corruption. No, he stayed. He said, uh, I want to be there to, um, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Chair now recognizes Ms. Wild for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. I.G. Storch, um, I'd like to um, ask you a question. But first, let me just say I have the honor of representing a district that includes one of the largest Ukrainian-American populations of any community in the United States. And I suspect, although I haven't been here for every questioner's <coughs> um, comments, more than a few of us have claimed that, that distinction. 
but in my case, it's real. Um, and, and this community also happens to pay United States taxes, so they are taxpayers. Um, they understand just how vital the fight for Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty and democracy truly is, not just for U Ukraine, but also for the United States. But they also want their tax dollars to be spent efficiently, and so do I. Um, they know that this effort to help the Ukrainian people has, in fact, been a model of efficiency. Um, we sometimes hear assistance to Ukraine described as constituting a blank check. Um, I think that far from a blank check, our support for the Ukrainian people has been an investment in the rules-based international order that is the foundation of our own national security. Um, but can you describe the importance of this investment, not just for Ukraine, but also for all of us here in the United States? How does it make us more secure? So thank, thank you for the question. Um, and uh, as has been alluded to by uh, both my colleagues, as IGs, we are very careful not to set policy or get involved in that aspect of things. We do oversight. The Congress sets policy, the administration sets policy, right. and then we do oversight sure. to make sure it's being carried out. Have, having said that, uh, given the scope of, and I'll speak about the security assistance that's being provided, it's critically important that people see that there is oversight and the Congress know that there is oversight to ensure to your, to your constituents' concerns that those taxpayers' dollars are spent properly and as intended, and, and that's what we're doing. And just to be perfectly clear for people who may be listening who don't fully understand this, your title, Inspector General, that your job is oversight. Is that correct within the administration of the dollars that are um, being appropriated by Congress and being spent towards Ukraine? That, that's absolutely correct. And, and in fact, when you say within the administration, we're appointed, or in my case, appointed by a particular president, but we're appointed without regard to partisan affiliation. It's right in the statute. And sort of in the, again, in the world of strange things, I actually have been appointed by presidents of both political parties to be an IG in my prior job in this one. And so at some level, I personify that, but that's true across the community, um, which I've been honored to serve in for a long time. That work is done in a nonpartisan way. Uh, what we do is of too much interest to people, um, so we have to make sure that there's never any question about our work or uh, where it's coming from, so we're very careful. So let that. me just switch gears slightly because um, I, I, you know, you, in your testimony, you described the process of conducting oversight of aid at the speed of war. Um, can you describe your relationships with Ukrainian officials in the process of how you work with them under these circumstances to do this oversight? Sure. So as has been, thank you for the question, as has been uh, testified to previously, that, that's still uh, in the early stages, I would say, but we've gotten good responses and we're working to develop those relationships, building on the existing uh, relationships we have in the region, um, uh, both through the embassy and otherwise. And so um, we, we do have, um, you know, good uh, relationships that we've been developing, and we're looking forward to continuing those, particularly, as was mentioned, uh, by, the pos by the ability to put people in country, so that looking to the future, we're there in, at the embassy developing those relationships, meeting with counterparts in the Ukrainian government and elsewhere on an ongoing basis when we do this. So overnight. let me just ask you this. Have you encountered any obstruction, concealment, do you have any concerns about um, that, that, that have arisen in your oversight capacity in terms of the relationship with Ukraine and how the money is being used? So we have not encountered any, any such problems at all. Um, as was mentioned um, in our uh, relationships within the United States, we've gotten you know, great support within the DOD. I think they also understand the importance of this, um, and we appreciate that. And with the Ukrainians, uh, we've not encountered any problems at that time. Though, again, this is we're, we're going to keep moving forward, and we're going to hold them to that. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentlelady yields. The chair now recognizes Mr. Waltz from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Angarello, uh, you in your July of last year, 2022 advisory notice, you mentioned that USAID planned to provide direct cash assistance uh, to Ukrainians for humanitarian needs. You also noted uh, that cash assistance comes with inherent risks. I think that's a 
pretty obvious statement, uh, particularly in a country that's 120th in the world on the transparency scale, uh, because it's highly fung fungible, difficult to track. So, you know, we're talking about wartime aid. My colleague was just talking about wartime aid. Talk to me about how the dissemination of U.S. funds through direct cash assistance to Ukraine has differed within USAID and what lessons you've learned from direct cash assistance to Afghanistan. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, the, the financial assistance through USAID is, is being provided in, in two ways, uh, the majority of which is being provided in the direct budget support through the World Bank. Through the World Bank, right. Yes, and Got so it. that is the, those are the funds that um, are being transferred to the World Bank into three trust funds, and the, the World Bank as the trustee then disperses right. those on a reimbursement basis. The second area um, with significantly less money is in the humanitarian assistance portfolio. How much money? Right today? now, there's t in the in total humanitarian assistance portfolio, $1.4 uh, billion. Okay. That's not all um, cash assistance through humanitarian assistance. Um, there is a, a large portion, I'd have to get back to you on the specific number, that is going as either in-kind humanitarian assistance or cash to um, citizens in need in Ukraine. How do you oversee food. the disbursement of cash in a war zone? So what we do is we partner and we have the oversight authority for the um, either contractors or in this case, some of the UN organizations um, and, and USAID contractors that are doing the work. So we have authority to oversee the... the are the they contracted firms, Ukrainian firms? No, no. They're, they're, they're non... Firms? Most of these are non-NGOs uh, that USAID has longstanding relationships with. And we as the IG have longstanding relationships with them and um, regularly interact with them. So some of the 20 fraud awareness briefings that I mentioned and the thousand people that our investigators have gone and done um, fraud awareness briefings for. How many USAID employees from OIG or otherwise are in Ukraine? Right now, right. Uh, my understanding is USAID, the agency, has seven um, employees uh, working specific and direct And there's a hires. cap on the number of personnel at the embassy, correct? Correct. And we would have no. Would you be able to, and would you want to, I would hope, send more direct U.S. government personnel to both oversee the contractors and directly oversee the aid, if allowed. Absolutely. And How many more would you send? Right now, we've requested at a minimum to have two law enforcement criminal investigators. We actually had two that were able to go TDY this week are to these, build those relationships. Are these the seven that you do have, which I would postulate is a pittance compared to one of the largest humanitarian, direct budget, and military aid programs I, I, probably the largest since World War II, yet we have self-capped, the White House has capped, the number of people that we can have there from the U.S. government and from the IGs. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And those, just to clarify, those seven direct hire staff are for USAID, the agency, not the IG. They're not dedicated you to You have no position. IG personnel permanently stationed in Ukraine? Correct. Would you like to? Yes, and we, we, are, like actively, we are actively uh, pursuing Why that. are you being told you can't? We, we have not been told that we cannot. Um, we've received support from, the, this is a State Department process, so when we were in Kiev in January, we received support from Ambassador Brink and from the State Department, and we are now going I know the through. ambassador wants more, I asked her. Yes, so we are actively going through the State Department's process on getting those approved spots. Do the contractors, since you can't have direct folks there, do the contractors have direct access into the ministries, into their financial systems? The Deloitte contractors that are operating on behalf of USAID, my understanding is yes. Um, under the MOU, the bilateral MOU that USAID has with the government of Ukraine, um, Deloitte, USAID, and our staff would have direct access to those, those That's systems. reassuring. I think your efforts as IGs are reassuring. My message to, and please take this back to both aid and state, uh, is that there is a direct correlation to continued domestic support to your ability to be able to get in theater and do your job. And we cannot artificially constrain ourselves and provide all of this aid, but then not allow you to go provide appropriate oversight. And I hope we learn the lessons from Afghanistan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield my time. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes Mr. Schneider for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our, our witnesses today. Um, I speak for my district, our country. We're, we're grateful for your work. Uh, impressed by your personal commitment to what you do, uh, but also 
by the breadth and depth of your organizations and all the people who are, are, are doing the, the, the vitally important uh, efforts to make sure that we're uh, overseeing the, the aid that we're sending uh, to Ukraine. I, I'm going to start with some questions that are maybe kind of basic, but just help my understanding, help me explain it to, to my constituents. Um, you've established this Ukraine Oversight Interagency Working Group. Uh, and I think I'm paraphrasing or maybe quoting some of what you said. I see three objectives. One, make sure aid is going where it's intended. Two, make sure aid is being used as it's intended. And three, that uh, U.S. goals and objectives are being achieved or on their way to being achieved. Is that a fair description or should I expand on that? I think that's fair. Okay. Um, let me take it from a different angle, again, just to uh, describe it, is the things that you all look for include um, fraud, waste, and abuse, obviously. Um, I've heard and, and read in your statements corruption and, and collusion, whether it's collusive bidding, whatever. Diversion, misallocation, uh, misuse, or, or misapplication of what's being sent. Are, are those the things that we're looking at? Yes among others. What, what would be some of the others, just to make sure that I, I have them on my list? Well, I think an important aspect to our mission is efficiency and effectiveness. So of course we want to identify, uh, identify fraud, waste, abuse, diversion, things of that nature, but we're also here to try to help the U.S. government uh, operate more efficiently and effectively, and so I think that's an important aspect as well. Okay. Um, anything else I should add? or? I, I would also add misconduct. So from USAID's perspective, in addition Good to point. misconduct of personnel um, in the US government sphere, we are also looking at misconduct on behalf of uh, people employed by the NGOs or UN partners that are implementing USAID programming. Okay. Um, going back to what I was talking before, especially the third goal, uh, measuring progress against goals and objectives. Uh, the reports, and I will go in and read them in more detail, have you identified that? And I know, I suspect we can't talk in an open forum about the specific goals and objectives we have for the aid uh, in detail, but measuring our, our progress towards that, um, how are you uh, set up to do that specifically? So I can kick it off and just say um, that uh, a great example of one of the ways that we're doing this is with uh, the foreign assistance that's flowing through the Department of State. So we have ongoing work right now looking at whether the department has developed a strategy and what that strategy looks like um, to inform the funding that's flowing through foreign assistance. And so that's going to be an important sort of baseline. And then that positions us to come back in after the fact and look at the effectiveness of that strategy as it's actually, actually implemented. So that is an important part of our work. Great. And, and that's exactly what I was looking for because it, it shouldn't be just money going willy-nilly, but have a strategy, know where it goes, and then go back and measure it and, and look forward to do that. Let and me shift gears a little bit. Can, can I just yeah, add? Please. I was just going to add another example that may help. So in all our work, what, you know, as I said before, we don't set policy, right? That's, right. Uh, that's up to others. But we look to see if the efforts of the departments and agencies we oversee are achieving the desired policy and are there ways to be more effective in doing that. So a great example of an ongoing project we have right now, which is in, it goes right to this, is validating the requests for assistance from Ukraine. So we're looking to see whether controls are in place within the DOD to when they get this demand signal for a particular type of you know, military assistance, how is that being validated? Then how is that being coordinated with partners to a point we've talked about before? And then a third part, which we may end up splitting off to try to be more agile in our reporting, is uh, how is that being sourced within DOD when, when the Americans are gonna supply it? How does that need get met? And so we're looking to see are the controls in place to do that efficiently, effectively, and as we've talked about before, yep. at the speed of war. Great point. I think that's where I was going with this. Is it's important for us to understand not just that we've watched and made sure money was spent as intended, that there was no corruption, collusion, et cetera, but that we are truly achieving our goals and, and that our strategy was set in, in, right in the, in the first place. Uh, I have a big question. I only have a little bit of time left, so I'm going to throw the question out. We can talk about it later, but it's really our what are your blind spots and how can we in our role help make sure that you're working to uh, address those blind spots, some we know, some we may not yet be aware of. That's for another day. Uh, I'm over time and I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Moran for five minutes. Thank you all for being here today. I first want to 
uh, say that uh, your role is absolutely critical, as you know, but publicly, let me just state, it's imperative that the role that you're providing to the American people uh, is fulfilled to the greatest extent possible because it is, in fact, taxpayer money, U.S. taxpayer money, that's going abroad uh, for a number of items that otherwise could be used here. I want to I want to communicate to you some things from my district. I come from Northeast Texas, and I want to mention five specific concerns, and there's a lot of concerns uh, out of my district and my constituents, but five in particular I want to mention here today uh, that I want you to keep in the back of your mind because as we go through this process, I need to be able to say to my constituents, we are addressing your concerns. It's important for me to do that. I want you to know, uh, first, that my constituents are rightfully uh, questioning why U.S. taxpayers have sent more than $100 billion to Ukraine to defend its borders when this administration does little to nothing to secure our own borders, particularly the southern border along the state of Texas. Second, my constituents rightfully question why U.S. taxpayers are contributing billions of dollars to support pension and retirement plans for Ukrainian officials when our own Social Security Trust Fund is going broke and we have other needs here abroad uh, domestically. Third, my constituents rightfully question whether our own military readiness is being compromised by the fact that we're sending billions of dollars overseas and whether or not it's taking a back seat to the military assistance provided to Ukraine. Fourth, my constituents are rightfully concerned about potential widespread waste, fraud, and abuse of monies expended. A lot of what you've talked about here today, and I'm going to get into some of that with my questions. And then fifth, I want to mention that my constituents are rightfully concerned about the levels of contribution by European nations to the Ukrainian defense of this unwarranted Russian invasion, since those nations are closer to that conflict and more affected by Russian aggression. In fact, what they ask me uh, time and time again is, why are we ca carrying such a heavy load? And is our money, in fact, being used the way it should be used? And why aren't we using it for priorities here in America? And I understand those questions. Now, even in light of those questions, I'll tell you, they understand the need to push back against Russia. They understand the need to ensure that this unwarranted, uninvited invasion by Russia into Ukraine needs to be defended and repelled. So uh, we'll start there and hopefully we'll end with a good conclusion, uh, but it cannot be in a, in a world where the money sent by U.S. taxpayers is unaccounted for and used inappropriately. Let's talk, um, Ms. Angarella, let me, let's talk about the fraud um, investigations that you mentioned earlier. I know USAID has set up English and Ukrainian language hotlines for reporting fraud or misuse of USA. The State Department OIG initiated audits of U.S. humanitarian assistance to Ukraine on September 29, 2022. From the joint oversight of the Ukrainian response released on March 27, 2023, it was quoted as saying, as of March 1, 2023, the three OIGs had received 189 Ukrainian response-related hotline complaints, including allegations submitted by Ukrainian citizens regarding alleged misconduct within Ukraine, end quote. Uh, I'd like to know, out of those calls that you've received, how many actually get looked into? How long does it take to determine that the allegations are either credible or not credible? Thank you for your question, Congressman. Um, f to answer the first part of your question, we have had now to date, as of earlier this week, 178 at USAID OIG. Um, we have how long it takes to evaluate them. It, the initial assessment is very quick. Um, we've even, uh, with them coming in in Ukrainian, we have even um, have inside services, language services in our office where we have translators that can translate them pretty quickly. For our first line uh, invest in, uh, assessment in our hotline <clears throat> intake to decide whether it first has a nexus to USAID funds and USAID programming. If it does not have a nexus, then we will refer it immediately to either, you know, if it comes in um, for one of my colleagues here or another agency, we would immediately refer it. For the what's, ones that what's have the most uh, common allegation of fraud? Procurement fraud, 
um, I would say uh, collusive bidding, um, the things that are happening at the back end, um, which I think is really helpful for us to get out in front of. And that's why it's really important for our investigators to go out and do fraud awareness briefings where they identify for uh, procurement officials and contracting officers what to look for. Um, and that's the example that I gave where the contractor spotted this um, and was able to identify it and report it to us before uh, the, the bid rigging collusion happened. Okay, thank you for that. I see that I'm out of time already, Mr. Chair. That went by fast. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Gentleman yields. Chair now recognizes Mr. Stanton for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I want to thank the inspectors generals for being here today. This is an important hearing and you're doing very important work. We have a duty to stand by our allies to support the Ukrainian people as they defend themselves against a tyrant's unprovoked assault on their sovereignty. Helping Ukraine win this brutal, atrocious war is essential for the future of security in Europe and for preserving democracy in the face of autocracy around the globe. But this committee has also has a duty to the American taxpayer to make sure that every single dollar of assistance is spent the way Congress intended, that every single person and every single uh, weapon, excuse me, sent to aid Ukraine, uh, every single weapon is properly accounted for and does not fall into the hands of bad actors. Now, Congress and the Biden administration built in extensive oversight mechanisms for that very purpose, including the fact that Congress, number one, voted overwhelmingly to require a monthly update to Congress on U.S. security assistance provided to Ukraine. Two, um, your work with our allies to track all weapon systems before they leave the U.S. and once they are in Ukraine. This includes on-site inspections, which restarted in October. And three, the Department of Defense, State Department, U.S. Agency for International Development created a joint strategic oversight plan. The oversight activities done as part of this plan found that all direct financial aid given to the Ukrainian government was in line with congressional requirements and federal control standards, and that the various United States government's oversight offices, more than 17, are working together to provide comprehensive oversight and regular updates to the American people. But as part of the Joint Strategic Oversight Plan, the Department of Defense's Office of Inspector General found that there is room for improvement in overseeing enhanced end-use monitoring items to trust but verify that arms like Javelin missiles or tools like night vision goggles end up where they are supposed to. Now, by necessity, the U.S. has a limited presence in Ukraine, but we all agree that it is absolutely essential this work is completed regardless. With that in mind, Mr. Storch, can you, Mr. Storch, excuse me, can you tell me more about how the Department of Defense Office of Inspector General conducts oversight over the enhanced and use monitoring items in Ukraine? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, and it is an area in which we are laser focused and will continue to be as long as this continues. So um, we uh, have uh, sent teams out to the region uh, to gather uh, information regarding uh, what is a evolving uh, situation, obviously. Um, you mentioned our 2020 report where we looked at the way in which end use monitoring was done and it generally was compliant. Though there were some issues with the night vision devices, we made some recommendations on that. Most of those have been closed. Then we had the report that came out last fall, very different situation, uh, ongoing uh, hostilities, uh, war going on. And so we found that under those circumstances that the uh, department was not able to meet what were then existing requirements for EUM, although there were other things, and this is where it gets classified, that the department was doing to keep track of, of the uh, weaponry uh, that was provided. But the situation continues to change as staffing in the country continues to change. So we've now, have, we have ongoing our third evaluation in this area. Um, and as a, we are looking to do agile reporting to get out some of those results as we continue to work on the overall uh, project. And then we're gonna be, we're already starting to plan for the next one. So I would say it's an iterative process. We're continuing to evolve as the nature of the assistance evolves. Um, we, we have also, I would say, been able to use the lessons that we learned during COVID, frankly, um, in terms of how to do some of the remote uh, type of oversight um, as we all uh, throughout the world had to learn to do things a little bit differently, right? And so we've been able to apply some of that to our work and then looking to the future, um, as has been testified to, uh, we believe it would be helpful to have people uh, posted in country and we have also engaged the process to, to start that ball rolling um, so that we're able to have people in country are able to interact 
on a regular basis, both with our American uh, military folks in country and with the Ukrainians uh, to make sure that the end use is monitoring is done. So it's <coughs> ongoing, it's evolving, and it's robust. Thank you. And, and on the issue of staffing, Ms. Shaw, there was only a limited number of civilians allowed at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev due to security concerns. Uh, how is that affecting U.S. oversight of assistance to Ukraine, and what do you think should be the appropriate staffing levels at the embassy? Thanks for that question, um, and I realize we're short on time, so I'll try to be uh, concise. Um, we are, to date, able to pr uh, produce the oversight that we need to. Uh, we've been creative. We've used some remote technologies. We've also engaged with people as they've cycled out of Ukraine into Poland. Um, but we are looking to, to secure positions in Kyiv that will be hugely helpful, especially for our future work. Um, I don't have an opinion yet on the, the staffing levels at, at the embassy. We are doing ongoing work looking at embassy operations. But I do uh, know that um, in the Lessons Learned report that we published that uh, staff considerations are very important, and so we were happy to arm the department with some of the lessons learned from our past work to help inform these decisions. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Self for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to say that uh, my fellow Texan, Mr. Moran, uh, perfectly articulated the five concerns that my uh, citizens have as well, so please take those back. Uh, I want to go to your strategic oversight plan that the three of you signed. Uh, you articulated my two concerns on page 17 and 18 perfectly. One is internal to USAID. One is external. And I want to follow through the U.S. government to the World Bank uh, to Ukraine. Your first uh, quote that I want to have is, uh, following the February 2022 invasion, you ask approval for an expedited process uh, to do your oversight, and the audit will examine the trade-offs inherent in the accelerated procurement practices to determine whether the mission has developed the procedures necessary to safeguard the award process from undue risk and support to your new strategy in Ukraine. Has that happened? That was well over a year ago now. That's an internal question. Sure. So the work um, I think that you're referencing is an ongoing audit um, that we are working on. Our audits are done to very thorough standards, um, and, and we're happy to come and brief you on the status of that. No, but I, don't, I don't think my question is about the audit itself. It's the internal processes that you put in place so that you can measure the risk of your audit, your accelerated audit, versus the risk of, of undue fraud or abuse. Sure, so, so I'm asking about your internal process, it's not the audit itself. Yes, yeah, so our internal process, what we've done to respond to um, this new portfolio of work that, that came to, um, to light after the February invasion is to staff up quickly. And we are doing that in order to look at the agency, USAID, the agency's expedited procurement. Um, so the, the expedited procurement processes that were approved by the administrator for USAID at the start of the war, which allowed them to reprogram money um, in Ukraine, because USAID was already programming in Ukraine before the invasion. Right. So the expedited procedures are for USAID internally, and then what we as the OIG will do is to assess whether they, they, how well they did that and did they stick to internal controls uh, and risk mitigation strategies when they repurpose so, that money. So what's your analysis of it? It's been over a year. So some of the funding, um, I think, uh, took longer um, depending on the amount of money. And so one of our audits, it, it's encompassed in several of our ongoing audits right now um, in the humanitarian assistance sector in the energy sector and in agriculture. So none of those reports have been issued um, to date. They are uh, ongoing, some are planned. But again, you're talking about the audits themselves. Uh, please assure yeah. me that the internal processes within AID have been put in place for your accelerated process to, uh, to, to make sure that this is done correctly. I think two things are sort of being conflated here. One is the U.S. aid, the agency's accelerated procurement actions, and then the second is 
USAID IG's oversight of those. And what we are doing as USAID OIG but is looking at those to make sure that they were done um, according to USAID's internal uh, plans Again, and I procedures. Ask, were they? That's the assurance I'm looking for. So as of right now, it's I over I, a year. Yes, as of right now, um, the, that work is not complete. So unfortunately, I can't give you an assurance today without that work being complete. But as soon as it is, we're happy to, to do that. Okay, I have one minute left. Let's talk about the World Bank. Uh, your very next paragraph was perfect. Um, multinational uh, institutions like the World Bank, where U.S. donations will merge with, with funding streams <clears throat> from other international donors, has the potential to reduce transparency and oversight of your uh, contributions. Um, have you assure me that the World Bank, because I'm very concerned, because the World Bank is uh, independent of U.S. government. So we are sending our contributions through the World Bank, I understand. They are then merged with other donations to Ukraine. Have you audited the World Bank? So to be clear, the USAID OIG doesn't have jurisdiction or authority to audit the World Bank, okay. but we have access to all of those reports that are being provided to USAID, the agency, and as an independent monitor and experts, we will we are assessing those reports that they, as they come in, and if we see indicators of fraud that would warrant a deeper dive from an independent um, perspective that our agency provides, we will do that deeper dive. To date, we have not seen any significant issues like that. Okay, I don't have time to get into it. I would also like uh, for you to look at the, uh, the uh, deep relationships between Deloitte and the World Bank. Um, uh, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Sherman for five minutes. Thank you. We've been talking about uh, the level of aid that we provide compared to other countries. I think this is a good investment in America's security and in world security. That being said, we should be pushing on our European friends. May, uh, we are doing more, even on a per, we're doing more than Europe in total. We're doing more as a per capita, as Mr. Wilson pointed out, other than four countries. But keep in mind, Bulgaria doesn't have a fleet in the Pacific, in effect, defending Taiwan. Um, Lithuania doesn't have a responsibility to fight uh, uh, ISIS in Syria. And so if uh, uh, Europeans should be spending, uh, I think, more on this. And in general, we understate when we report to the American people and when we tell our European friends how much we're spending on national security by deliberately not including veterans' costs. And the veterans' benefits are part of how we compensate our troops. Uh, it, under generally accepted accounting principles, uh, that's certainly a cost of our defense. Um, I now want to focus on this idea that uh, we should have a certified audit of what defense articles we're providing uh, Ukraine. I watch a lot of World War II movies, and you. They're, they're a pretty similar. Uh, there's always somebody for each part of the audience to identify with. There's the New Yorker, there's the Southerner, there's the Italian American, there's the Irish American, and I keep waiting for my, my people. And then you see D-Day, and the landing craft comes in, and the door opens, and out come the auditors. They've all got green eye shades on. They're carrying their 10 key adding machines from the 1940s. There are my people. <laughs> Netflix has everything. And so throughout war, of course, uh, certified audits have kept track of every shell and every bullet. Uh, but more to the point, uh, it's hard to have a certified audit even of a Defense Department at peace. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Storch, um, uh, it's the, uh, every other part of the federal government has since the 19, uh, well, certainly since uh, 2023, have satisfied the requirements of an external audit, except the Department of Defense. Um, 
as of November 2022, the Defense Department had failed its fifth ever audit, unable to account for more than half its assets. After 1,600 auditors combed through uh, the DOD's $3.5 trillion in assets and $3.7 trillion in liabilities, officials found that the uh, department uh, could, could not account for about 61 percent of the assets, according to the Pentagon's uh, uh, controller. Is it reasonable for us to think that we can, uh, uh, that, that the Ukrainian military could pass an audit uh, in war when we can't pass one in peace? Uh, so, first of all, thank you, uh, Congressman, for the very compelling portrait of auditors. My folks will appreciate it. Um, uh, with, regard, with regard to your question, um, I, you know, I, I'm really not in a position to comment on the Ukrainians. Um, what I will say is on the American side, we are doing robust work to do oversight over the department's finances and particularly focused on the systems that are being used to account for uh, the assistance to Ukraine. I want to thank all the uh, inspector generals for your work and uh, yield back. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes Mr. Baird for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. appreciate it, and I appreciate all the witnesses being here. Uh, my first question goes to uh, Ms. Angularella. Uh, in a statement last month, you mentioned, quote, but for real comprehensive, robust oversight, it can't be done remotely. The closer we are, the more comprehensive the oversight will be. So my question is, can you provide uh, me the steps that your department has taken to check the use of assistance to Ukraine once it's in the country since you mentioned it previously. And additionally, can you tell me how many auditors have been sent to the Ukraine? Sure, thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, to date, to be clear, we have had no permanent staff um, assigned to Embassy Kyiv. Uh, USAID OIG is unique because we do have foreign service uh, staff and personnel um, who are willing and um, ready to go. Uh, we are in the process, as I mentioned, with our, our colleagues here to go through the State Department process requesting those permanent positions. To date, besides my colleague and I who went for the day in January, we've had two um, investigators that were just able to go in TDY for three days this week. Um, they were law enforcement criminal agents doing fraud awareness briefings and working on MOUs that we are having signed with five separate um, government agencies with the uh, within the government of Ukraine. To date, we have not personally had any auditors um, go TDY or, or go to, to Ukraine. How we're doing our work, um, as I mentioned, on the, the direct budget support, we are reviewing all of the reports that are coming in from the World Bank, from Deloitte, um, and from USAID, and the ones that are being submitted to Congress and to, that we have access to and are taking an independent assessment to see if there are any red flags that would warrant um, a deep dive, a further deep dive from our office. Um, but that being said, we are also, uh, I think we mentioned our hotline poster, which we distributed among in, with, if, within Ukraine, is widely um, circulated right now, hence the 556% increase in the reports that have come to us. So there are ways that, that we are being able to do our work effectively, but I think to be as comprehensive as we possibly can be, nothing replaces eyes on the ground seeing the programming happening and making those relationships. So thank you, and then I want to turn to all the witnesses, and um, and that question deals with uh, the Ukrainian government, and uh, have they been proactive and helpful partner to oversight, I mean to provide these oversights, and how willing has the Ukrainians been to open their books and allow full transparency of how assistance is being used? So all three witnesses, I want to start with uh, Ms. Shaw. Thank you for your question. Um, so it is still early days, but I think we've made a really good start. When we were there in January, the three of us had the opportunity to meet with a range of um, well-positioned and important Ukrainian officials within the government. Um, and so we, we 
conveyed a very uh, unambiguous message about the American expectations around transparency and accountability. Uh, as I said in my opening, that message was well received at the time, um, but of course the proof is in the pudding. Uh, and so we are building on those initial interactions to deepen our relationships, to identify trusted partners, not just within the Ukrainian government, but in law enforcement, the, within the prosecutorial entities as well. And so while we haven't met with any resistance to date, uh, and so far there's been broad willingness, we're continuing to press that. Ms. Angaril? Yeah, I would um, echo all of that and say that to date our office is in the process and have received commitments and in, in some instances are sharing drafts of an MOU uh, with the Prosecutor General, with NABU, with SAPA, which is the Special Prosecutor for Anti-Corruption, with the Ministry of Finance uh, with the Econo and with the Economic Security Bureau and with the Ministry of Infrastructure. So those are all tangible MOUs that are in, in the works right now between my office and these uh, government in, uh, entities. Um, in addition, we uh, have agents there right now that are working on establishing uh, additional relationships and then implementation of how this is going to look. We can have MOUs, but what does it look like to say we agree to share information? And that's happening um, by our two investigators that have been there the last three days. So making significant steps towards that um, as expeditiously as we can. And uh, I see the limited time. I'd, I'd echo all of that. And I suppose the other thing I'd add is that we're working very closely together on this as well. Um, so we're able to partner to ensure that we're leveraging one another's experiences there. So between us and then the larger working group, we're really able to do this. So maybe we can start with you next time and you'll have more time. Okay, thank you very yes, much. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to discuss the role uh, that non-security assistance pay, you know, plays in Ukraine's resistance efforts, and specifically, I, I believe, U.S. economic and humanitarian assistance, two areas of assistance that have been particularly scrutinized today are essential to ensure that frontline Ukrainian service members can focus on the fight and the battlefield and feel some sense of relief that the essential needs of their families are being taken care of. In fact, uh, Chair Kane and I recently held a subcommittee brief on this very topic. Uh, during the briefing, expert administration witnesses provided further details on how U.S. direct budget support to Ukraine helps to keep Ukrainian health institutions open, allows first responders to meet emergency medical needs, ensures that children uh, of Ukraine can continue their education, uh, and supports the continued work of civil services, provides essential support to pensioners, uh, particularly vulnerable uh, portion of the population that simply cannot survive without this support. Uh, this direct budget support not only provides a vital boost to the wartime economy, but it also ensures the continued legitimacy of the Ukrainian government with its own people, uh, which is critical for their will to fight. You know, Putin has uh, attacked their infrastructure. He's weaponized, uh, you know, attacks on energy, on, on food availability, on, on health care. And in the subcommittee briefing, we also discussed how this assistance has reached up to 3 million people with food assistance, support for service internally for internally displaced people. It's kept the lights on uh, in Ukraine. It's provided safe drink wa drinking water for 5.6 million people and distributed health life-saving health care uh, supplies to 4.2 uh, million people. Just to name a few examples uh, of what's been done. In short, uh, I said during that briefing that while U.S. and NATO military assistance has been uh, indispensable, I believe U.S. economic and humanitarian support are equally necessary to guarantee Ukraine's wins in this war uh, are, are, are uh, reachable and also to secure the future after the wartime uh, hopefully uh, resolves itself uh, quickly. I want to recognize recent actions taken by the Ukrainian government to ensure effective management of U.S. assistance. Ukraine has forged ahead with anti-corruption measures and rule of law initiatives, demonstrating the importance with which they view uh, accountability. In fact, uh, a few weeks ago I met with the Prosecutor General Kostin, uh, who's made clear to me Ukraine's determination to root out corruption at the highest levels. In my discussions with my Ukrainian counterparts, uh, they made it clear that they see any misuse of assistance to Ukraine as a treasonous act against the government itself. 
turning back to our witnesses, uh, I've read your testimony and listened uh, here today, and I have to say that anyone listening to your testimony should be impressed with the focus and attention that your agencies placed on oversight and our assistance to U Ukraine in general. Uh, from audits uh, for our assistance to end use monitoring uh, of defense articles to deployment of third party monitoring organizations together, uh, your departments have conducted a vast array of congressionally mandata mandated oversight measures ensuring that every dollar of taxpayer money spent in Ukraine is spent wisely and without diversion. For example, with regards to the U.S. direct financial support, and, and to quote the report directly, quote, the mechanisms for monitoring and oversight of funds made available under the FY 2023 Ukraine Supplementary Appro Appropriations Act for direct financial support for the government of Ukraine are in place and functioning, and that the government of Ukraine has in place substantial safeguards to prevent corruption, ensure uh, and to ensure accountability of such funds. That's directly from the report. So simply put, the report we're discussing today is without a doubt, it's a good news story. Uh, the oversight mechanisms in place for assistance to Ukraine go above and beyond typical safeguards, including hiring a third party uh, private uh, auditor in Deloitte. And I believe the work of your office has undertaken is another demonstration that U.S. taxpayer dollars are being spent wisely, appropriately, and in furtherance of our U.S. national security for the benefit of the Ukrainian war effort. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Keene. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank all three of our witnesses for being here with us today and for the important work that they do. As the chairman of the Subcommittee on Europe for the 118th Congress, I share Chairman McCall's sentiments that while military, humanitarian, and budgetary support for Ukraine is crucial as they are embroiled in this conflict, we must have oversight. Like the chairman, I believe that we do not conduct this oversight with the intent to undermine or to question the importance of this funding support Ukraine, Ukraine. In fact, it's just the opposite. We intend for our oversight efforts to incentivize this administration and our Ukrainian partners to use these funds with the highest degree of effectiveness and efficiency. Congress has appropriated over $113 billion to respond to Russia's war in Ukraine, and the American people deserve to know how the substantial sum of taxpayer dollars is being spent. I cannot overstate how important transparency and accountability are for the support to continue. I am um, the first official function that I held as chair of the Europe Subcommittee was a briefing by state and the USAID for members of the subcommittee and it was a briefing on the oversight efforts and direct budgetary support for Ukraine. To echo my opening statement from that event, to your knowledge, as the three principal inspector generals, have the departments and the agencies that you oversee cooperated in good faith in your oversight efforts? Yes, from USAID's perspective, yes. True also for State Department. And for the Department of Defense, yes, absolutely. And, they've, and they have uh, responded in a timely fashion to your request for information. And what about the Ukrainian government officials? Yes to all of those questions. Yes. The same. Okay. Um, to all the, um, I'm encouraged to hear there have been no significant cases of corruption involving U.S. assistance to date. Um, however, I also want to make sure that the U.S. is ready to respond in case any instances of corruption were to be exposed. Um, to all the witnesses before us today, what roles do the investigative branches of your offices have in the oversight e efforts, and are they ready to respond to, to reports of waste, fraud, or abuse involving U.S. assistance, and what would that response look like? 
So I, I'll, I can start just speaking about uh, the Department of Defense, Inspector General. We have the Defense Criminal Investigative Service, which has you know decades of experience investigating cases uh, in wartime situations all around the world. Uh, we have agents who are forward deployed in the region who have robust relationships with people in country um, and people, uh, law enforcement and others around the world um, that we're able to leverage to do those investigations. Um, as we receive allegations, we look into them and we'll take whatever investigative steps are necessary and we'll determine what the results are. Thank you. Um, from USAID's perspective, I would uh, echo all of those things and say further that our investigators are used to working in non-permissive environments and where there might not be uh, direct jurisdiction for the U.S. government. So we, when we have jurisdiction, we'll pursue every criminal, civil, and administrative remedy possible, and those are not mutually exclusive of each other. We can, we can pursue several at the same time. Our office has creatively used suspension and debarment of U.N. officials uh, this past year to, for officials that we cannot, we don't have jurisdiction of, we can't arrest ourselves, um, but we can use suspension and debarment as a tool to keep these bad actors from showing up in other U.N. programs or other NGOs. Um, additionally, we will work with local government and prosecutorial bodies within the government of Ukraine um, where we can. And previous uh, work that we had in this area, we coordinated with the government of Ukraine and extradited um, somebody who had committed fraud against USAID programs, not a Ukrainian, but they were in Ukraine, and we successfully worked with them to extradite them to the United States and prosecute them successfully here. So our office has this experience, and we, we are ready to, to do it if allegations of fraud come in. Thank you. Michelle? And I'll echo everything that my colleagues have said and, and just note that we are being both proactive and reactive. So short answer to your question is yes, we are absolutely ready. And that's where some of the relationships that we're beginning to forge with Ukrainian officials and law enforcement and prosecutorial entities will be so important because there are some uh, bad actors that we may not be able to reach on our own. But we're also being very proactive uh, and that's important to get out ahead of issues. We don't want to just clean up messes. We'd like to try to keep them from happening if at all possible. And so the fraud awareness that we're doing now is going to be critically important to that, making sure that people understand how to report fraud. Um, so all of those things are already happening and really position us very well to act when the time comes. Thank you to all three of the witnesses who are here today. Uh, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Allred. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you to our witnesses for your work. Uh, thank you for being here for your testimony. I think it's been uh, very enlightening. Um, I certainly agree uh, with the chairman's statement uh, that he said when he was following his trip to Ukraine earlier uh, around there being no significant acts of fraud or misuse involving uh, U.S. assistance and, and also uh, the oversight that's been done I think is important. Uh, there are limits to that usefulness uh, and I do wonder, uh, you know, we on this committee held a markup this week on a resolution of inquiry uh, to request another audit and, and transmit a huge amount of documents related to uh, our, our support for Ukraine that I think was introduced by a member of this body who does not support our support for Ukraine. And so it's not, it does not go hand in hand that all oversight is productive uh, because it is also true that uh, the Kremlin is watching closely uh, the discussions that we have here and any cracks in our support for Ukraine will be used against Ukraine. We want to make sure the dollars are spent wisely, but there are limitations to it. And I, I find some of the uh, continued focus to try and find something where there is nothing uh, to be disconcerting and not in the pursuit of oversight, but perhaps in pursuit of something else. But I want to ask you about uh, two things that I, I think at this point of the hearing maybe have not been discussed yet, which is very few things that are left. One is partner country oversight, uh, and the other is training audits and, and how that operates. Uh, and so I just wondered, uh, Mr. Storch, if you could discuss how you evaluate partner country oversight mechanisms as, a, as to what they're doing. Uh, how would you characterize uh, our efforts in comparison to theirs, lessons that learn, maybe lessons they can learn from us? So thank, thank you very much uh, for the question. And um, if, if I can, with regard to the prefatory remarks, um, you know, one of the things that we're able to do as IGs in each of our offices 
is bring sort of a methodology that we use to address all sorts of issues, right, and bring it to bear here. So when we go and we do audits and evaluations, we're using the same standards and methodologies we use in all sorts of other work to ensure that we're making uh, findings and recommendations that are authoritative and really drive positive change. Um, so with regard to partner countries, our remit is obviously focused on the Department of Defense, but we understand the Department of Defense isn't operating in a vacuum here, right? There are a lot of countries that are assisting Ukraine. So we're looking at issues where those intersections affect U.S. security assistance. Um, so one uh, that is an interesting project that's going on right now, and I think an important one, is looking at the way in which when the Ukrainians request assistance, how that is validated, but then how it's coordinated with partner countries. And how are the partner countries, how are we working with them to ensure, we the United States, to ensure that the, that's being handled as efficiently as possible. So we have lots of relationships with oversight entities for partner countries, particularly on the investigative side, um, and then also the international audit uh, organizations as well. But what we're trying to do is bring that and leverage it for the specific you know, Ukraine oversight mission. Would you say that we're helping them in, in their oversight efforts as well? Is, is that how you would characterize it, or, or is it that uh, independent of, they do their own independent? They, I would say they do their own, but we engage. Yeah, state and USAID, would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I would say um, in this context, especially with the limitation of being on the ground, the relationships that we have with other donor countries who might not have the same restrictions are really enhancing our work and, and the lines of communication. So for example, last fall, my office convened a group of oversight um, folks from the donor community as well as the UN uh, community. And we sat and said, how many allegations has your Office of Investigations get? How many has you know yours received to compare to make sure that we're also getting the same data and we're staying on top of issues and one of us isn't missing something? So that enhanced communication and collaboration, I think also helps us do our work better, particularly in the Ukraine context. Yeah. You say do you anything to add? Or? I concur. Nothing yeah. more to add. Yeah, and I guess I'm assuming that our uh, return to presence in Kiev uh, will help with that as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for your testimony. Thank you for your hard work, uh, and we'll certainly, uh, I'm sure, uh, be talking mm -hmm. again. Thank you. I, I yield back. Joan yields back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Kim. Thank you, Chairman McCall. Um, I want to thank our witnesses for joining us today. You know, I want to start by asking all of you the reporting requirements or reporting mechanisms that you all have in place for Russian capture of American equipment, the weapons, and do your agencies have a means of tracking those uh, captured equipment? So, um with regard to security assistance to Ukraine, when the weapons go in to the country, it, there then are there are agreements as to how that's supposed to be tracked, and the Department of Defense has the responsibility to do this end-use monitoring we've talked about, or enhanced end-use monitoring, to ensure the accountability of the weaponry. What we do as OIGs is we do, and as I've testified, it's a robust, ongoing series of work, and it's going to continue to be so because of the importance of the issue to ensure that the Department of Defense is doing that work in compliance with applicable regulations mm -hmm. in uh, doing it efficiently and effectively to make sure that there is that accountability for the weapons. Can I hear the other agencies? Thank you for your question. So um, the Department of State has a, a much smaller role in end-use monitoring than the Department of Defense, but we do have a small piece of that, uh, particularly on the um, front of civilian security assistance and direct commercial sales. Um, and so that is something that is the subject of our ongoing work. We are looking uh, very carefully at how the department is doing its end-use monitoring under the circumstances uh, and are looking forward to publishing that work, which I think will um, highlight some uh, important issues and hopefully offer some good recommendations as well. Briefly, Ms. Angela. USAID is not doing end-use monitoring. Hmm. I want you to know that uh, one of the issues that I am following very closely with regard to uh, Ukraine conflict is food security issue. Uh, Russia's bombing of ports and grain uh, silos in Ukraine has worsened what was already a dialed food security situation, so I'm really 
committed to ensuring that our food security assistance is getting to the people who need it and that there is no waste of uh, abuse. So I want to ask your working relationship with those large UN agencies, uh, especially those with World Food Bank and UNICEF. And so can you uh, explain how you coordinate with them on your oversight efforts? And uh, what role do information sharing, uh, those information sharing agreements play in the, that oversight that you conduct? Sure. Um, thank you for that question. USAID is actively doing agriculture um, assistance in Ukraine right now, both um, on looking at the resilience of the Ukrainians in, in their agricultural system and then also looking at the impact it's having on the rest of the globe and the food insecurity that, that you just described. And our office has two ongoing um, or, or planned uh, audits of those two programs. With respect to the UN organizations, as I, I testified earlier, I, we just came back from Rome um, and met with the three primary agriculture uh, UN agencies there, WFP, FAO, FAO and EFAD, uh, WFP being the largest of, of those. Um, according to USAID, approximately a quarter of USAID's funding goes, through, goes to the WFP. So that's a primary relationship that we have, um, one with the leadership at, U, at uh, WFP explaining what USAID's expectations are and us as the IG for them to report and disclose to us when they see allegations of fraud or misuse. Um, and then also the relationship that we have with their oversight, um, their IG. Uh, we have a longstanding partnership with them where we meet monthly, we share our investigative reports. Um, they have a requirement um, in certain programs to also report to USAID IG if they find instances of fraud with respect to USAID programs. Sometimes we work those cases jointly. Um, sometimes we let their uh, inspectors or investigators work them and then they report back to us and, and USAID. Um, so those are very effective in helping us identify what's happening and where we can jointly put our resources together to, to investigate Thank cases. Thank you for explaining that. I know you mentioned the, uh, the Ukraine's agriculture sector. So um, can you speak to that uh, assessment of the oversight and accounting measures that I know you just talked about it, but with respect to the projects that uh, include joint ventures with uh, private sector entities? Sure. So in, in July of 2022, USAID um, committed $100 million to bolster the agricultural exports, uh, exports and alleviate the global f uh, food security crisis. Um, there's four separate programs right now that you, the mission um, is conducting, uh, the largest one being, I think, that the agro program. Um, and so the, the implementing partners that USAID is using are ones that they have used in the past, um, mostly Comonix, DAI, uh, and the World Council. And so we have relationships and we have longstanding work that we've done with those NGOs as well. Um, they are included in our fraud awareness briefings that I mentioned um, that our investigators are going out and identifying and training the staff on the ground for the NGOs on what to look for, um, for potential schemes that might be compromising U.S. assistance in agriculture programs um, happening right now in Ukraine. Thank you. I wish we had more time, but I think my time's up, so I'll yield back. Thanks. Uh, Joe Lay yields back. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Costa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate the opportunity for this important hearing to <clears throat> talk about an issue that's been discussed a great deal here in, in the last year, and that is, is the American taxpayer dollars being spent wisely in this effort as we support uh, the brave Ukrainian people, and, and as people talk about Ukraine fatigue, and I remind them that uh, the Ukrainian people are not fatigued because they are standing for their sovereignty and, and in a uh, much bigger way, standing up for democratic institutions around the world, including our own. Um, I, I want to get to the heart of this matter. I'm obviously a very strong supporter of our involvement, along with our European allies and NATO, to ensure that the war criminal, President Putin, does not get away with the atrocities of this uh, invasion of a sovereign nation. Having said that, um, the aid that we have given, Congress has appropriately and fittingly, as we do in the past, require audits to ensure that these taxpayer dollars are wisely spent. And I must tell you that the Ukrainian members of parliament that I have worked with over the last year who are very much at the fo forefront of ensuring that 
the corruption that has historically been a part of Ukraine uh, does not um, uh, uh, prevent them, uh, that they put a stop to it and that they manage their own best practices to ensure that uh, we feel that there is integrity in how these dollars are spent. Uh, with that said, um, I, I'm going to ask the three of you the same question. Mr. Storch, uh, you with the Department of Defense have been doing this, I think, for a while. In all of your efforts with the audits on the monies that we have sent to the Ukrainian uh, military for their defense, have you been able to find any misuse of funds in your audits that would uh, raise red flags to Congress to ensure that uh, something is, is wrong here and we need to address it? Uh, we have not. You have not. And uh, Ms. Argella, uh, with the audits that you have conducted in terms of humanitarian aid and USAID and other efforts, um, uh, have you determined or have you found any misuse of American uh, taxpayer dollars uh, in the assistance that we have provided to the country of Ukraine? Our audits have not, no. And, and Ms. Shaw, with the Department of State, and obviously you have a lot of experience as well, in how uh, our U.S. Uh, uh, support, um, not only here in Ukraine, but in other countries that we have provided support, where any misuse of funds or, 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 or dollars that were targeted for certain purposes, for economic and for uh, nation building as State Department works it, have you found any misuse of funds uh, thus far of the, of the literally billions of dollars of taxpayers' money in that we have provided Ukraine? Uh, our completed work has not substantiated any uh, findings like that. All right. Well, uh, my concern is this, and I think, uh, and obviously uh, people can have different views on this, but because I believe for ourselves and for Europe and for NATO that this is the test of our time and whether or not we are going to stand up for the common values we share as democracies, that some people who don't share that view uh, are, are, are trying to cast doubt as to whether or not taxpayer dollars are being misused as a reason that maybe uh, we should withdraw our continued support. And that's why the work that you're doing, I think, is so important for the integrity of, of our support uh, for this critical uh, challenge that we face today, uh, ourselves and our European allies. Um, do you get a sense in your audits in working with the ministries in the Ukrainian government and with their parliament that there is a similar concern? Because clearly it's not in their interest, I would not think, if in fact they, and they've had to deal with corruption historically in their country, so they understand the problem, uh, that, that this would undermine the support we're giving them and that the Europeans are giving them. Have you detected in your working efforts with them about their concerns? So I, I just say that we, so to be clear, we don't audit the Ukrainians. In our no, case, we audit the United States provision of security yeah. assistance. Um, but having said that, in our engagements with the Ukrainians, both when the three of us went to Kyiv and in subsequent Ukraine uh, engagements, we have heard consistently they understand the importance of being transparent. They yeah. understand the importance of accountability. My and time is just about gone. Any best practices that you would recommend to the committee in terms of how we go forward in the future to ensure that these tax dollars that Congress and, and the administration uh, appropriate for this very critical, important purpose uh, can ensure that we provide the protections and the guarantees that we in Congress want to have, that the administration wants to have, and that the American taxpayers uh, feel that is, uh, they deserve? A complex question, but a simple answer is to do exactly what you did, which is to empower <laughs> OIGs and oversight professionals to get in early, to be pre-positioned, to get out ahead of fraud and uh, issues like that. And time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Wagner. Hi, thank you, Ms. Chairman. I thank our witnesses for their service. Uh, the United States is leading international efforts to help Ukraine defeat Russia's abhorrent and utterly unprovoked invasion of its sovereign territory. These efforts are necessary to stop Russia in its tracks now before it attacks a NATO partner, triggers Article 5, and puts U.S. service members in harm's way. Equally important, U.S. 
uh, support for Ukraine demonstrates to the dangerous and volatile regimes in Tehran, Pyongyang, and Beijing, and elsewhere, that the United States is prepared to meet any threat to its partners and meet it with strength and resolve. The deterrent power of this signal is critical for international security. We must continue to ensure our support for Ukraine is as efficient and effective with the proper transparency and oversight that I think you all are providing as possible. I appreciate our witnesses' important work in um, this regard. Uh, Deputy Inspector General um, Ang uh, Angolera, put simply, how many audits are being conducted of U.S. direct budget support to Ukraine, including by the World Bank, the government of Ukraine, USAID, USAID Inspector General? For USAID Inspector General, our planned and ongoing work includes 22 separate audits. That includes the direct budget support in all of USAID's programming. Um, I, I could get back to you. I'm not sure exactly how many reports between the World Bank, between um, their third party auditor that they've contracted, between USAID's uh, six month reporting to, to Congress and Deloitte's reporting. Um, it's a substantial amount. We'd, we'd like to get that figure. That would be very helpful for committee um, just uh, as a whole. Congress requires that prior to obligating any direct budget support funds, the Secretary of State and USAID Administrator must, and I quote, certify and report that mechanisms for monitoring uh, and oversight of such funds are in place and functioning, and that the government of Ukraine has in place substantial safeguards to prevent corruption and ensure accountability of such funds. The IGs for the State Department and USAID are also required to report to Congress about your assessment of these monitoring mechanisms and safeguards, I'll say. Deputy Inspector General Angolera and Shaw, uh, what is your assessment of these monitoring mechanisms and safeguards? Um, are they, are they, are they ad adequate to detect any potential misuse of U.S. direct budget support? I'll start with you, Ms. Angolera. Sure. Um, thank you for that question. And we've recently issued a joint report looking at um, whether or not uh, the World Bank mechanisms and oversight controls that are established right now meet, uh, meet uh, GAO's internal control standards. And our assessment and evaluation is that they do. The next report that we're working on is, t is looking at the effectiveness of how those mechanisms are working. Um, and that, that's our next step in our process. Misha. And for our part, we looked at the Department of State certification process and whether that was um, uh, consistent with their typical process and well-informed. And we, uh, in the two reports that we've issued to date, certi uh, certified that they had followed their process. Great. Thank you very much. Deputy Inspector General um, uh, Angolara, USAID has contracted Delo uh, Deloitte to work with Ukraine's Ministry of Finance to review its internal monitoring, transparency, verification, and reporting systems uh, and procedures. Have you evaluated Deloitte's work with Ukraine's Minister of Finance? And how do you assess the systems and procedures of Ukraine's Ministry of Finance? Sure, with respect to the work that we've done, we have access to Deloitte's uh, reports that they provide to USAID. Uh, they just provided, uh, issued a report in January um, in our audit team that is focused on solely on direct budget support and, and oversight of it, reviews those reports and identifies if there are any um, areas or flags of, of concern for fraud that we would want to do a deeper dive and look into. As of today and all of the reports, our independent team has assessed uh, no such instances have occurred. And they've been working specifically with Ukraine's uh, Minister of Finance in this regard, correct? Correct. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Um, I've completed my questions, and I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Representative Hill, for brief Thank comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's glad to have recognition from the gentleman from Tennessee. Thank you for your patience being here, IGs. We're grateful for your participation, because as you've heard from every member on both sides of the aisle, while there is tremendous, strong, bipartisan support 
for the humanitarian, uh, governmental, lending, and military support for Ukraine, there's also tremendous uh, anxiety and interest from our constituents, not only here in the United States, but also in Europe, for European countries, that, that is a full accounting made for all of uh, that support. So thank you for the work you're doing on the front lines of that. In December, after the House was briefed by uh, Secretary uh, Blinken and Deputy Secretary Adeyamo on funding for Ukraine, I made two principal points to them and followed up with a letter. Uh, Congress has, to date, not really had the full financial overview of our support in each of the buckets that you've referred to, so direct governmental support, humanitarian support, both at the United Nations and through USAID, and um, military in a way that they can compare it to other countries, because part of building consensus in Congress is to demonstrate that while we may have been upfront a major, major contributor here and, per and the dominant military contributor that we want to see the world come behind us and play an important increasing role. And we saw that just uh, in uh, the week, President's Day week, when Prime Minister Kushida in Japan pledged $5.5 billion uh, towards uh, Ukraine support. And that's what we want to see uh, more of. And so this work is very valuable, and I'm grateful to you. Um, uh, Ms. Agronella, I want to ask you a question about USAID. So you have, <clears throat> you give money to the UN and you give money to uh, contractees with USAID, USAID, which are trusted NGO groups that you regularly do business with. But you were, uh, the agency was pressed to give money directly to NGO groups preferred by Ukraine, for example. Is your auditing different in the how one looks at the trail of money going into a UN agency versus a longtime USAID contractor versus a Ukrainian NGO? With respect, thank you for the question. Um, with respect to the NGOs, whether they're large NGOs that we've worked with for years in the past, uh, or we being USAID in terms of providing oversight, not we as in the agency, um, versus a smaller local NGO or a new partner, we, we do our work the same exact way. Um, it's a little bit different with UN organizations and, and the access that we have. Um, it, it goes as far as what USAID's access uh, is agreed to in the ADS um, for access to UN documents. With respect to the what USAID calls implementing partners, the NGOs, um, right now in, in Ukraine, because of the work, it's major um, NGOs that I mentioned that USAID has partnered with in the past. And then there are sub-awardees that the large implementing partners will conduct um, will give sub-awards. And our oversight extends to all of those Good. agencies. That's helpful. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you have each have investigative arms of your bodies, and so to what extent uh, do they, are they responding to, you know, allegations of waste, fraud, and abuse? Maybe each of you could just respond to that, and are they, um, you know, what does their response look like to you? Are they on the ground? Are they doing it by email? How are, how are, they, how are they operating? So uh, DCIS, which is part of the DOD, Inspector General's Office, has people all over the world, including people in Europe, uh, posted forward. Um, and we respond um, to all allegations of waste, fraud, abuse. And have you, seen, have you seen that call for and therefore deployed a team into Ukraine or into uh, Poland or another port of entry of material moving into Ukraine. Right, so so we've gotten a variety of allegations, frankly, without getting into specifics, typical of the type of allegations one gets in these sort of conflict situations. Um, and uh, on at least one occasion, I'm aware of our folks have reached out into Ukraine to get information. We haven't had to deploy okay. anyone there, but if we need to, we will. Let me turn to our two other State Department. Sure. We have received 178 complaints related to Ukraine, um, which is, I mentioned, a 556% increase, which to me indicates our outreach is working and people know who to come to to report things um, from the ground uh, in Ukraine. We don't have any permanent staff in uh, Kyiv right now. We have Foreign Service agents um, 
deployed in uh, closer to it in Europe in Frankfurt. But this week, we just had two criminal uh, agents uh, do TDYs for three days in Ukraine, one taking uh, further investigative steps on an open investigation, and others just doing um, sort of this relationship building that we were talking about. Good. I'll leave it there. But if you could respond in writing, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hill, for your riveting testimony and question. At this time, I recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Ms. Angarella, say your name for me, ma'am. Angarella. Angarella. Well, you can imagine Birch it. It just gets. It's okay. Thomas Massey always says um, he wants me to have an event called Fish Fillets with Tim Burchette. And I said, so, but that's not how you say it. But anyway, uh, Ma'am, what methods are used to prevent waste, fraud, or abuse when paying these Ukrainian pensions? Thank you for the question. The, the pension support is being provided through the direct budget support, uh, which is going through the World Bank uh, and being done on the reimbursable basis. So when the expenditures are um, incurred, then the process is for the Ministry of Finance or the government of Ukraine to certify that, submit it to the World Bank. The World Bank, uh, as the trustee who manages and supervises the fund, looks at and to make sure that the expenditures comply with their internal procedures and their protocols, and then they disperse the funds. Um, on top of that, USAID, the agency, has contracted with Deloitte um, to do its own spot checks and uh, within the Ministry of Finance. Wait, you said with who? With Deloitte, Deloitte too, sure. um, to do uh, spot checks and capacity building, not not audits per se, but capacity building, um, including with GAO doing capacity building for the internal or the external audit um, entities within Ukraine. So those are some of the the different levels in this multi-tiered oversight approach. And then our job as USAID OIG is to make sure that we are aware and we are monitoring all of these reports. And from an independent perspective, we're identifying if there are any gaps. Um, in those monitoring controls that are already put in place. So you have a pretty good feeling for this, that it's not being stolen, that it's going to where it's supposed to, towards the Ukrainian pensions. Is that correct? As of today, yes. As of today. Thank you. Um, are those the same methods we use when we pay housing and utility subsidies? Through the direct budget support systems, those are all done the same way when they're going through the, the multi-donor trust fund, um, the peace fund, yes. Okay. Another report by USAID to Congress says that the Ukrainian tax revenues will remain depressed for the foreseeable future. Does your report detail how long we will have to provide money to Ukraine? It does not, Congressman. That would be more of a policy decision um, for most likely this body and our State Department and USAID senior leadership. But our role as the IG would be to oversee any of the funds that are expended. If you had it, just a gut reaction to that, do you, would you have any idea at all or you just don't want to get into that mess? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Both? Both. <laughs> all right, ma'am, that's, that's a good answer. You're not from what, what? What end of the country are you from, man? Rhode Island. Oh wow! Well. <laughs> All right. Another. Uh, let's see. Um, can you think of a time when the inspector generals have had to revise their initial report because of fraud, waste, or abuse was discovered? I would say that not that we'd have to revise an initial report, but we would do a subsequent report. Um, a lot of our work is done in phases. Uh, disbursements of money and programming happens in phases, and so we try to phase our work uh, that way. So we wouldn't go back necessarily and change uh, an initial report, but we would modify or have s different findings in a subsequent report. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. And I... Yield back my time um, to no one. I'm not really sure why we even say that. Uh, Mr. Lawler, you are currently recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Storch, uh, I certainly appreciate DOD's uh, end use monitoring of U.S. origin defense articles uh, to ensure transparency and verification of U.S. military aid. Can you please describe how DOD conducts end use monitoring on the front lines and other areas east of Kiev? Uh, and what challenges are there in conducting effective oversight? 
So thank you for the question, uh, Congressman. Uh, End-use monitoring and enhanced end-use monitoring, <clears throat> excuse me, for the more sensitive items is something that we continue to focus on. We've done, as I'm sure you know, a series of evaluations. We have one pending right now, and we're going to keep doing it as the situation continues to evolve. And frankly, the standards have evolved, right, because end-use monitoring is something that historically has not taken place during active combat necessarily. And so the ability to get to the front lines, to your point, may be limited. So probably not my place to testify about what the department is doing right now. We are evaluating that. I can say I've heard in testimony that the department has indicated that they're getting out more than they were able to before to do some of the, you know, um, uh, some of the visits to actually lay uh, eyes on. And they're using other methods. Some of those get into classified type issues, so I can't really talk about that um, in this in this forum. Um, but we're looking we're looking at all that, and we're going to continue to look at, at all that going forward. And one of the things we are going to do is try to use agile reporting as we do that work to get things out as quickly as possible and as transparently as we as we can. Great, thank you, Ms. Shaw. As you. Uh may know or may not. Uh, my wife is a Moldovan immigrant uh, and currently ser and I currently serve as the co-chair of the uh, Congressional Moldova Caucus, uh, which all of my many colleagues who are here are welcome to join. Uh, Moldova has felt the effects of uh, Russia's war uh, on Ukraine significantly. Uh, they have taken in over 600,000 refugees, which amounts to almost a quarter of their current population. Uh, within the, the country's borders. And they've suffered disruptions in trade and energy supplies. Um, increased aid to Moldova is necessary uh, to maintain economic growth, uh, secure its borders, and, and further assist the country in responding to Russian aggression. Uh, I understand your inspection of the programs and operations out of our embassy in Chisinau uh, are ongoing, uh, but can you please describe its scope and methodology? Thank you for the question. So uh, we recognized that um, countries in the surrounding region are going to be very heavily impacted by this, and so we felt it was important to make sure that our work reached to those areas. As you said, we do have an ongoing inspection of the embassy in Chisinau. Um, and so the scope of that work will be to look uh, not only at the typical functions that we look at uh, with uh, any of our inspections, executive leadership, alignment with uh, strategy and uh, performance goals, resource management and the like, but a specific focus will be how the situation in Ukraine is impacting the country and the embassy and how the embassy is responding to that challenge. And so I think that that work will address some of the concerns that you've raised. And when do you expect uh, the investigation to be complete? Hmm. It's, a, it's an inspection and I can get back to you with the specifics, but I think it would probably be out later this summer okay. or early fall. Um, you know, prior to uh, obviously uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, President Sandu uh, was working uh, with our government here in the United States uh, and the previous Congress uh, to put in place sanctions uh, on, you know, Russian oligarchs and others who uh, had corrupted uh, the prior administrations over there. So I think the more that we can continue to uh, support her efforts, obviously, uh, will ensure their long-term uh, stability there. Uh, how many uh, U.S. aid, state, and DOD personnel are currently on the ground conducting oversight uh, across all inspections? If that's a question about uh, Office of Inspector General mm -hmm. personnel, we currently do not have permanent staff based at Embassy Kyiv. For our part at State OIG, we have been able to advance our audit work by sending in teams on uh, TDYs. And so that's been effective up to this point, but we have officially requested from the department uh, positions at Embassy Kyiv going forward for oversight. I know that's true for each of my colleagues as well. Uh, to date, we've received uh, department support for our request, and so we're working through that process, and we've been assured it's being given expedited review uh, given the circumstances. Okay. Um, my time has almost expired. Obviously, uh, transparency and uh, accountability uh, and oversight is critically important, uh, but we must continue our support uh, of Ukraine, uh, and I support uh, the efforts to help them uh, reclaim their sovereignty. So thank you for your work. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lawler, and we now recognize uh, Mr. McCormick, who bravely served our country in the United States Marine Corps as a pilot and now is in Congress with us. Mr. McCormick, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I definitely feel like it's uh, 
to America's great benefit to be a partner in defending Ukraine, uh, preventing the unprovoked Russian ambitions to take over a country and to continue to expand their, uh, what I would say is probably something that Peter the Great has been quoted by Putin. People think that he's just a, a, a former KGB guy who's part of the Soviet Union. He, he literally quotes Peter the Great. And in many ways, it's in their DNA when you talk about Catherine the Great uh, having to expand her borders in order to secure her borders. So we understand what's at stake here. Uh, I thought it was interesting that the Biden administration has constantly been too slow in delivering needed weapon systems uh, for Ukraine to win this. Uh, the president's irresponsible rhetoric prior to the invasion and reluctance to act more decisively since then has caused Russia's unjustified aggression war to Ukraine to continue for longer than it should have ever been continued. I will say the original Biden plan, as I understood it, was to have President Zelensky flee to America, not learning the lessons from Afghanistan, which I participated in also, and which I think would have been catastrophic as Ukraine would have folded instantly without leadership. And we would have had another war probably in Moldavia or, or possibly Estonia or Romania, who knows? Because his stated objective was to continue to grow the, the Russian empire, if you will. Uh, I understand the violent and chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan has created this security vacuum where now China is, is very aggressive, Russia is very aggressive, and there's a lot of uncertainty as where we're going to go from here right now. Uh, what I'm concerned with is I've seen great accountability as far as my questions being answered on where our military aid is going. We can see downrange how it's affecting this war and how Russia is being really uh, beaten badly in many ways. You've seen a massive amount of armor taken out, personnel. Uh, we're at a stalemate right now. There's about to be a counteroffensive with, with any blessings. Hopefully we'll be successive. And when I say we, I mean them. Um, what I am concerned with is any protracted war, anybody who's been to command and staff school, anybody who's studied warfare and understands the limitations of American warfare, is you lose popular support by extending a war, no matter who you are. Russia lost popular support in Afghanistan. So did we. Um, if we don't have accountability for our equipment, uh, we have a problem. I feel like the military equipment has been well accounted for. What I'm concerned for is the Biden administration's plan to spend about a third of our money in their economy and not in the ways that I think American people would, would be supportive of. For example, union pensions. Um, I just don't think that that's going to be popular. I don't think it's going to be sustainable. And what I'm worried about is losing popular support for a war that has great ability to keep us out of a war. And I want you to speak on that as far as how we're spending our money outside of military. Sure. Um, thank you for your question, as uh, I appreciate it as the proud daughter of a retired Air Force pilot. Um, the, the funding that is uh, going to the, the government of Ukraine to supply uh, pensions and salaries for uh, civil servants is, as I described, going through the World Bank's trust fund um, as the direct budget support. So it's, it's not going directly from the government of the United States to the government of Ukraine. It's going through the World Bank as the trustee uh, for the, the funds. In addition, the mechanism that policymakers decided to use was a reimbursement mechanism. So the expenditures are being submitted after they've already been paid for by the government of Ukraine. And the government of Ukraine is certifying that these were eligible expenses. So it, it's not money that is allowed to go um, to support any other, even government ministries, other than the salaries or um, what is specified in the agreement. And that's what the government of Ukraine is certifying, um, that they went to the eligible expenditures. And then the levels of uh, oversight that have been built into this uh, system of oversight is what I'm calling it, uh, then falls to the trustee, which is the World Bank, to look at using their own very well-established like internal standards, controls, um, and procedures to certify that they were eligible. Um, and then USAID has a responsibility as well. Yeah, so when you talk about eligible expenditures, this is exactly what I'm talking about. The fancy words for basically saying things we don't want to go to. Uh, I understand how the reimbursements work, but just like when we give money to anybody in the federal government, we usually have strings attached to where that money goes. I think it would be a very good idea to understand that the American people ultimately hold us accountable and we'll hold anybody we give money to accountable. And it can't go to things that the American people don't support. And with that, I yield.
Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, for five minutes. I thank the chairman, and I want to express uh, up front that I believe it is in the national security interest of the United States to provide assistance to the resistance in Ukraine to uh, repel the Russian invaders um, for a, several reasons. Number one, to prevent a broader war uh, in Europe, to deter that broader war, and to prevent a triggering of our Article 5 obligations under NATO. I think it's also important to send a signal to other totalitarian regimes, um, including uh, the regime in Beijing, uh, that aggression towards a sovereign uh, or at least independent democracies uh, is something that uh, uh, the civilized world will not tolerate. Having said that, uh, Congress, the American people through Congress, has now appropriated over $113 billion in emergency supplemental funding to respond to Russia's war in Ukraine. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Uh, and so in order to sustain the American people's support uh, for that effort and to fulfill our national security interest, we have to have accountability. And so I appreciate you being here today to testify about your efforts. It's why I support the 39 provisions enacted over four Ukraine supplementals uh, that require reports to Congress on oversight and accountability of all the aid sent to, to Ukraine. It's why I support the 64 ongoing planned uh, or ongoing uh, audits and, and reports by uh, GAO and the IGs for DOD, State Treasury, and USAID. Uh, my, my first question uh, uh, is, uh, relates to uh, the, the return on investment here and this national security uh, interest. Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, uh, General Mark Milley, testified to Congress last week that if Russia were to prevail against Ukraine, the U.S. need the U.S. would need to be doubling, doubling our defense budget. The $49 billion in security assistance packages to Ukraine accounted for just 6 percent of our 2022 defense budget. Spending single-digit percentages to support Ukraine seems like a pretty good return on investment for taxpayers, considering that we're delivering a body blow to one of our strategic adversaries, a blow that would have cost us much more to deliver ourselves. Given our national security priorities, would you say that our current spending in Ukraine reflects a responsible use of taxpayer funds compared to the cost of defending our allies in Europe should Russian imperialism go unchecked? So um, with regard to the policy question inherent in that, that's really a question for the administration and Congress, of course. Um, what I can say is each of our offices individually and working together and with our oversight partners are committed to doing oversight to ensure that the money that is appropriated is used as intended. Thank you. And um, we obviously cannot stand alone in our support for Ukraine. And US, the U.S. has assembled a coalition of over 50 countries to get critical weapons and supplies to Ukraine. According to a report by the European Union delegation to the, U to the United States, the EU and its member states have made available over $73 billion in financial, military, humanitarian, and refugee assistance, including a commitment of up to $19 billion uh, in additional assistance for 2023. Um, over $13 billion in military assistance has been provided to finance military supplies to Ukraine, train over 30,000 Ukrainian military personnel, and more. These numbers tell me that we are not alone in our support for Ukraine, nor are we alone in trusting Ukraine with the assistance provided. Could any of you speak more to the efforts made by our partner countries in Europe and beyond to support Ukraine? Uh, well, I'll take a side uh, route on that and, and simply note that at Department of State OIG, we have two inspections that are um, soon to be released looking specifically at the U.S. mission to the, Eastern, uh, to the European Union and the U.S. mission to NATO. And the focus of that work will be looking at how we are coordinating with our partners. So it won't be sort of assessing the sufficiency of the inputs that they're making, but ensuring that where we are also providing similar assistance, that there isn't duplication of effort, uh, that we are staying closely coordinated and that those contributions are aligned with strategic goals. Mr. Stork, uh, yeah. um, after the fall of Afghanistan, there seemed to be a large amount of confusion on the amount of weapons and materials uh, given to the Afghan National Security Forces that then fell in the hands of the Taliban. Have we learned any lessons from that? And have, to your knowledge, have any U.S. arms or munitions fallen into Russian hands? Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we, my office, again, prior to my being there, but my office did a substantial amount of work related to the weaponry uh, in, that, you're, that you're speaking about. Um, and to, to my knowledge, uh, we have not substantiated any diversion of weaponry, but it's, it's something we continue to look at on, on an ongoing basis, obviously. Thank you, I yield. Gentlemen's time has expired. I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we ask uh, that you respond in writing uh, to those questions. Pursuant to the committee rules, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, and extraneous materials for the record, subject to the length limitations. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>